Good morning and welcome to the Council Committee of the Whole meeting of February 21st, 2023. We are going to call this meeting to order. There is uh, only one item of business at this Council Committee of the Whole meeting and under item number two, under delegations, I'll turn this over to Mr. Manuel for an introduction. Thank you very much. So I'd like to introduce uh, Chad Lenz. Chad Lenz is with um, MNP LLP, who is the third party consultant hired by the city to uh, produce the Municipal Police Service Transition Plan on behalf of Council. Good morning, welcome. Good morning. Thank you. Uh, th th thanks for having us. I've got a couple team members with me here as well, N both Nathan and Shartina uh, from our team who have been uh, intimately involved here. So we'll be given, giving me a hand if, if and when needed. So um, I can just plug in here. And before you start, uh, how would you like questions just so I can... Uh, so I think that. the plan was I will go through my presentation, Chris will go through his, and then we'll do questions Perfect. after that. Thank you. Consolidated. Sorry, excuse me one second. I do need to take this phone call. I'm going to ask Deputy Mayor Pilot to come over and chair the meeting for one moment. Thank you. <laughs> oh, we can get some stuff done. <laughs> I guess, yeah, we can proceed. You've uh, kind of let us know how you want to go with it. So Excellent. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, so just agenda-wise, you know, we'll we'll touch a little bit on project scope. There's there's quite a few things going on at the same time. So just a, a bit of a reminder of what you know we were asked to do. Um, one one of the large components of that was community engagement. So we'll spend some time talking about community engagement. Uh, not a, a lot on current state. There's been lots of discussion in, in some of the reports you've done previously about current state. But um, as we move into then, you know, transition requirements and, and the frameworks around that, spend a little time around the legal and regulatory uh, environment around a transition. And then as a result of that, what um, is required in the transition. We, we've also got a slide on, on some strategic considerations. We've, of course, included them in the report. You know, they're not necessarily technical components of the transition, but they're certainly things that we think will be important uh, if you do move forward to have a successful uh, transition. Uh, so we'll, we'll briefly touch on those. And then we'll go into potential future state, um, you know, what the org structure could look like, um, you know, what are some of the components of that as we move forward, and then into uh, what are our estimates of what the cost of some of that would look like, and then, and then just a conclusion at the end. So. So first off, project scope, um, you know, the city undertook a, a review uh, in the last fiscal year looking at, you know, what the benefits of a municipal service might be compared to your current uh, contract policing uh, agreement with the RCMP. Um, you know, the results of that where there seemed to be some merits into pursuing at least what, what a transition could look like. Uh, and that's kind of where we come in. So the three major components of our scope were, as I mentioned, to uh, go through some community engagement and, and in a way, you know, um, where we can provide some uh, independence and objectivity. It's not people giving feedback to the city, it's people giving feedback to us and then we can digest that and, and feed it back to you. Um, it provides folks some anonymity, you know, and lets them maybe say things they might might not have otherwise to you. So that's, that's the role we play there. Uh, to do, again, a, a financial analysis of, of all the costs of those pieces and again, I think in a way that's independent and objective. Certainly we've had lots of discussions and spent lots of time uh, with uh, the transition team and, and others from the city. Uh, had lots of back and forths on, on um, most of those elements. Uh, have readily agreed on some and then disagreed on others and, and have worked our way to you know where we think um, is, is an acceptable uh, state. So, And then as a result of that, turn that all into a transition plan um, that the city can be confident in moving forward. So that's the scope of, of what we've been uh, given. So the first major component of that um, was community engagement. We did uh, a fairly robust round of stakeholder uh, interviews, one-on-one -on -one interviews um, several months ago now. Uh, a bit of a curated list of folks put together kind of between us and, and uh, folks from the transition team um, specifically those that interact quite a bit with the police, 
including uh, areas around, you know, homelessness, addictions, mental health, et cetera, and then uh, several other stakeholders from throughout the community. Um, off the top of my head, I don't remember the number of stakeholders, but 50, 60, something like that. Uh, and we were here in Grand Prairie to do those and did those in person uh, here. We also administered an online survey uh, that was um, accessible to the entire community. Um, we had, I think, 758 responses to that uh, and got some really good feedback out of that. And, and uh, of course, we hosted two open houses in conjunction with the city as well, um, where folks were able to come in, um, you know, gain some more detailed information on, on some of um, the particulars around what a transition could look like and, and ask questions. Uh, there was also the opportunity for them to provide anonymous written feedback uh, on um, on some feedback sheets on their way out the door. So those are the three major components of, of the engagement. I think in general, you know, we, we've got a bit more robust summary of this in, in the report itself, but I think in general, when we look at current state, you know, the community certainly sees, you know, your current police officers as well-trained, professional, dedicated. You know, in general, I think, despite recognized challenges, people still feel the community is relatively safe, you know, when, they, when they're walking around and in the community. There were some specifics that folks pointed out and, um, you know, things around, you know, the PACT uh, team, school resource officers, some of the deliberate um, intoxicated driving enforcement um, activities and, and some working relationships between the, the police and and some of the other uh, service providers in your community. Areas that were noted for improvement included things like better enforcement in certain areas, particularly related to, I think, drugs and the drug trade and the spin-offs of that, particularly property crime and the things that are perceived to come with that. Folks want to see a more robust, I think, um, enforcement of those things. Um, however, recognizing that they would also like to see an increased focus on the root causes of those particular issues, um, looking at some of that as a, as a bit of a symptom of some other deep, deeper, deeper issues. So uh, certainly more training for officers um, to provide trauma-informed service was something we heard several times. Um, folks would also like to see increased transparency and, and communication with the community and, and uh, as always with policing, increased accountability as well was something that was noted multiple times. Just some other things we gleaned from uh, both the survey and our, our conversations. Uh, social media is the dominant way people are getting their community safety information, um, most notably Facebook, um, which I think has some pros and cons to it. <laughs> Um, however, folks said the way they would like to be contacted by the police is still via phone. That was the number one uh, choice versus some other options, including apps and different things. Um, there was a specific question ar around um, reporting crime online, um, and 42% of folks said that they, they would prefer to do that, that that would be a good option for them. Um, it it uh, certainly is a, a facilitator of having crimes reported that might not otherwise be reported. So. As far as the transition in, in general, and, and I think m more of this came from the open houses than, than some of the other uh, components, you know, as far as positives, uh, perceptions around a transition, you know, increased accountability, having uh, a police commission, civilian police commission that oversees uh, the police was seen to be a, a positive. Um, certainly some increased flexibility around how some of those components fit together and, and work together was seen as a positive. Um, increased local decision making, expedited decision making, and, and some increased local economic benefit were seen, the things that were mentioned uh, in the open houses. As far as potential concern, concerns, um, you know, the, the, the other side of the increased local decision making was, you know, will we have the ability to remain impartial and have the right resources to be able to govern um, as well as we need to be? Um, some capacity uh, concerns about, do we have the capacity to recruit the folks that we need to to do that, both I think on the operations side and the governance side? And then, you know, what will this all cost at the end of the day? Were certainly questions that, uh, the most common questions that we would have received around the transition itself. 
Uh, you know, policing is a pretty complex part of the part of the world, and, and most folks, including myself, before I would have got into this line of work, you know, there's a lot of unknowns there, and, and certainly we heard several from folks. I think both in the comments from the survey and and from the open houses, um, certainly some misconceptions around how, how the RCMP are funded. Um, they are a federal organization, and I think there's some assumptions out there that a lot of the money comes from the feds. Um, of course, you know, in a, in a city over 15,000 people, 90% of that is paid by the city. And there are many components that you pay 100% of, including the building and, and several other major capital items, um, which, which refers to the second bullet as well. I think the other one, another one is uh, how municipal police officers are trained. Um, there was some some misconceptions that they may be trained to a lesser degree than, than the RCMP officers as they're trained at depot in Regina. Um, I think also the options um, available to a municipality inside of the Police Act as to what they can do with their police, whether they have a, a self-administered service or they contract that out or they start or join a regional service. Um, I think most folks were unaware of that. I, growing up in a small town in Saskatchewan, I just assumed the RCMP were the police because <laughs> that's the way it was. And I, and I think that's actually fairly common. Um, I think another one is how the MPSAs and the PPSAs work, particularly around specialty services. You know, there are several municipal police services in Alberta. They receive specialty services from the uh, provincial police, which is the RCMP in Alberta, um, and continue to, and there are arrangements to do those things. And I think the, the role of enforcement officers as well within a potential transition. We had questions at the uh, open house regarding um, I think misconceptions that this is a move to have more of that type of enforcement. And, and although there's a place for that inside of the model, we are, we are looking at a transition that would replace police officers for police officers and enforcement officers for enforcement officers. Each of them playing a unique role inside of that paradigm as they, as they do today. So current state, I won't spend a lot of time on it. Um, as I mentioned, you know, you've, you've had several reports on, on current state and, and comparing current state to what some of your options are. But just as a, you know, an oversight with a, as a city with a population over 5,000, you are required by the Police Act to provide uh, police services. Uh, you have some options there. Um, the, the option you currently are in is having an MPSA with the Government of Canada for the RCMP to provide those services. Um, this transition plan looks at one of those other options, which is to have your own standalone, self-administered municipal police service. So on to the legal and regulatory environment, and, and we wanted to provide, you know, more of this discussion here. You know, I think just to, to go over it again, it, it, there's a lot in here. <laughs> I think the other element is certainly the transition wasn't created in a vacuum. There's a framework that exists for these things provincially that guides uh, what what the uh, service can or cannot look like. Uh, so we just wanted to provide some of that to make sure it's clear. So you've got several acts that, that govern uh, all these elements and, and have been kind of guiding uh, principles for how we've created the transition plan. Uh, the first is the Municipal uh, Government Act, which allows you to pass your own um, bylaws for municipal offences. The Police Act is obviously a big, big element of this, um, and it outlines that um, communities over 5,000 must provide their own police service. Uh, more specifically, and, and this will come out in the conclusions of this particular section, that if you've entered into a policing agreement, uh, that you cannot, without prior approval of the minister, withdraw from that service. Um, you also have a Police Officers Collective Bargaining Act in Alberta that governs uh, police officers' ability to start their own associations. Uh, you have a, a relatively unique Peace Officer Act in Alberta. It's not um, as well defined or as robust of a program in, in most other provinces in Canada, uh, but it does allow the province to designate um, organizations to employ peace officers and, and grants them specific authorities under that act. Um, fairly new. You have a Police Amendment Act, which has changed some of uh, the governance and regulatory requirements around police services. Um, and we'll talk a bit about those in, in the summary of this slide, but it, it has added a, a more robust oversight mechanism um, and some other authorities for the province to be able to appoint folks to police commissions, et cetera. Uh, law Enforcement and Oversight Branch uh, is really kind of the 
uh, sets the standards and, and oversees policing and, and public security services and has a, you know, a fairly long list of those bullets there of all the things that uh, fall within their purview. Um, related, you've got policing oversight standards uh, for policing communities and commissions. And again, some of this is in a bit of uh, flux with the new um, amendment. And then you've got Alberta Provincial Policing Standards. So um, all services have to comply with these standards. Uh, in parallel to the process we've been undergoing with the transition plan, I know the transition team has been working on um, policies, procedures, et cetera, um, in conjunction that all adhere to these uh, Alberta Provincial Policing Standards. So from a requirements point of view then when you take a look at all those acts you know what are the pieces that we have to make sure are in the plan um, from the police act we have to obtain or you would have to obtain ministerial approval to withdraw from your current uh, contract um, you then also have to have approval to establish a municipal police service um, you then would create a police commission through municipal bylaw and once established the police commission must appoint a public complaint director um, that is one of the elements that is in a bit of flux right now under the new uh, amendment act that would that would actually change probably in the near future um, that 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 position wouldn't be necessary anymore but for right now that that is what you would still have to do um, under the bargaining act it's it's more of a, a to know more than a to do but certainly um, municipal police officers that are non-commissioned so under the rank of inspector um, are likely to form a, a bargaining unit and um, they, they are required to do that under the Act uh, independent from any other work group or, or municipality. So that will be a, a separate bargaining group that you will have to work with or the Commission will have to work with going forward. Um, related to the Peace Officer Act, the way we've structured um, a potential future municipal organization going forward does give a few more enhanced authorities to uh, the peace officers. Um, they are afforded those under uh, the current legislation. However, the police of jurisdiction, which is currently the RCMP, um, are, are, have some control over how that works and, and what authorities the, the peace officers are given. Um, under a municipal police of jurisdiction, that would change. Um, so there's just a couple of pieces to be mindful of there. So we've mentioned the Police Amendment Act uh, a couple of times. Again, it is relatively new, um, introduced late, late last year. There's a requirement to have a policing committee and police commission during the transition period. So a, a civilian oversight body that will oversee both functions. Um, and, and, and your bylaws will need to reflect that as a result of that. A part of that amendment is that each commission and its respective police service need to have a community safety plan. Um, which is um, something we're seeing all the provinces move to. Ontario has had it now for several years where they are mandated to have a community safety plan that is relatively comprehensive throughout the community, not just related to policing and crime, but related to all those social elements that, that fit in uh, to that puzzle. So that will be a new requirement as well as a diversity and inclusion plan will be required to be um, submitted to the police commission. Um, and, and as I mentioned, you know, once the Police Review Commission is in place under the new Police Amendment Act, the need to have that public complaint director will no longer be there. So there will be some transition here in the near future. And, you know, mentioned this briefly already, under the law enforcement and oversight branch, there is the need to develop policies and procedures uh, for both the commission and the police service. And, and some of that work has been happening in conjunction as we've kind of been working on what the needs are here for a potential transition. Um, some of that work's already happening, so. So on to strategic considerations, I've, I've just listed them here. You know, we've we've provided um, you know more detail in the report, but again, you know, not imperative to the technical transition, but things that you know we've certainly seen that we believe would be important moving forward. Um, elements like change management, the the people side of of change. You know, how do you alleviate some of those unknowns uh, to take down some barriers around change? Certainly, elements of employee health and wellness. Um, you know, the work that we do with police across the country, you know, this is a, a huge element, um, particularly the mental health of, of those folks that are doing uh, this really challenging work. You know, uh, 
how do you best design a, a robust employee health and wellness uh, paradigm to help mitigate some of those challenges for your team members? Uh, we've talked about ED&I and, and how uh, the new amendment uh, act will, will require a diversity plan, um, you know, certainly both for your hiring practices and then how aware your officers and team members are of those elements and how they use them every day and how they provide their service um, are important pieces of the puzzle. Um, you know, just touched a bit on hiring for diversity, recruiting outreach, there's, there's a fairly I think robust recruiting plan in the transition plan, but it's obviously an imperative part of, of doing the transition. You'll, you'll see here in a bit, the transition is spread out over several years and we think we've been somewhat conservative in it, but you know, there's, there are still deadlines and things in there to meet. Uh, you know, youth engagement, obviously very important uh, to set the stage for young people's interactions with the police and what that looks like. Public and media relations, uh, shared, shared services agreements, you know, we mentioned the relationship between the provincial police and, and the municipal police services. Lots of those exist in, in relatively informal agreements and I think there is room there to uh, formalize some of those so that, so that everyone is aware of what um, those agreements look like and what services are available and how you access them. And intelligence-led policing, and again, we've we've got some elements of that in the transition plan around the real-time operations center and other elements. It's becoming a, a part of the puzzle that's almost a necessity to, to function uh, at a high level in policing. So on to the potential future state. Um, we'll start with the governance side. You know, during the transition, the period, and, and we've got a timeline here uh, towards the end of this section, it's a, it's a five-year period. And over that time frame, the city will be required to provide civilian oversight to what is really a hybrid version of the RCMP and a municipal service. Um, both will be operating over that period as one uh, increases its resources and one will be decreasing its resources and the city will be required to provide governance uh, for that a hybrid entity during that whole period and then of course for the municipal service going forward if, if you so choose to go that route. Um, the Grand Prairie Police Commission would be established by municipal bylaw. Um, its composition is relatively prescribed inside of the act. The rules around how many folks from the city whether elected or otherwise you can have is prescribed based upon the size of the commission. Um, and you've got some flexibility around the size of it. One of the new elements of the amendment is that uh, the province can also appoint folks to the, that commission as well. Um, so it's, it's first roles though, uh, because it is, it is the first thing that would really happen is the establishment of the commission and, and shortly thereafter then uh, establishing a public complaint uh, director and then its next step is really to hire the chief of police. Um, we've included a note there on, on an executive director. We, we've put an executive director uh, full-time for the commission into the budget. We have worked with commissions that don't have full-time resources, particularly in, in smaller cities, although cities larger than Grand Prairie. And we find at times the commission struggles to move elements forward because it's a lot of off the corner of folks' desks. And I think particularly in a scenario where you're, where you're uh, in a transition, I think having a full-time resource to help guide that and, and continually ensure things are moving forward would be very important. So we've included that in, uh, in your governance model as well. So that uh, daunting looking eye chart is the, is the organizational structure and, and uh, I include it not, not necessarily for any of the details inside of it, but I think more to point out um, some of the uniqueness of the design, particularly the fact that we've got enforcement and outreach both inside the same command structure. Um, those teams will all be working inside of that command structure to be able to provide service in a way that is uh, even more coordinated than it would be today. Everyone is in the same command structure, on the same communication system, using the same records management systems uh, to create that efficiency um, and, and provide really, you know, I think, an, an increase in service in its ability to tier itself a bit more efficiently. 
So th this is really the overview of, of what that resource transition looks like. And again, as I mentioned, you know, the top line where you've got your RCMP sworn uh, members decreasing over that five year period and your municipal sworn increasing over the same period. Um, there's also an addition of four peace officers in the, in the plan uh, along the way. I, I think the other take home there is you see, you know, particularly through years two to four, there's a, a bit of a bubble in resources there. And, and that's where some of your transition costs come from when we get to costs. There are several resources in there that are dedicated to the greater degree on the transition itself. You know, some of those are recruiting officers. Some of them are field trainers. Um, so you, you do see a bubble in there because you've got extra resources during that time. And then at the end of the transition, uh, those resources through attrition and other means um, decrease back back to kind of where, where they began. And when we get to cost, there's a, a combination of those people costs in the transition costs and then, and then some capital and other hard costs that go into that. So related to that, you know, from a human capital's perspective during the transition, you've got a municipal transition team. Um, a couple of those folks exist now and, and are the, the folks that we've been working with. Um, that will expand though to include uh, some, some extra folks, including human resource advisors, communications, IT, um, and, then, and then external uh, assistance where required, including you know, other, other consultants or, or legal, legal advice. Um, there is a, a fairly robust civilian staffing model in there as well. Those folks exist today um, and are, are uh, municipal staff today. Um, the, one, the one major shift I think you'll see in there and you see it in the municipal employee numbers in the transition is um, your dispatch will change from the RCMPs, NAOCC in Edmonton to a local dispatch service so that there's an uptick in, in municipal employees there. Um, there will also be a dedicated police recruitment team during the transition um, to be able to, um, you know, get get officers uh, onboarded and and get down their path of of you know being trained, even experienced officers. There's a plan in there to go through a, a training element to kind of learn about Grand Prairie and and um, and the police service and kind of your the culture you're trying to build. Um, and then, of course, there's a, a plan as well for police cadet um, orientation and training, which again would occur here uh, as compared to now where your officers are trained at depot in Regina. As far as infrastructure goes, you've got your police headquarters now. That building has been uh, designed to police standards already for the use of the RCMP. It is, it is your building, uh, 100%. Um, there's no material changes that would have to happen to it. Um, there is a plan in the transition plan for some auxiliary space, particularly to accommodate that bubble of folks as you go through the transition. There's a budget in there. Um, we didn't land on the exact space, but we've got a budget in there for the space. From a fleet point of view, there is a, a need to procure fleet on an ongoing basis. Um, cruiser cars don't have that long of a life. You know, 30 to 36 months is pretty common. Um, so that, that rotation keeps happening through the transition and it's a part of the transition cost. And then you'll see in the budget when we flip to a municipal service that goes into the capital cost. Um, you own 90% of those assets already and there are terms inside of your MPSA that uh, outline how uh, the RCMP will reimburse you for that other 10%. Um, We've made the assumption, though, that by the time we start the transition, you'll need all new stuff anyway, because again, that, <laughs> that rotation is quite tight. Um, so there, there is likely to be some value there for you from the assets you already own 90% of. We haven't made any bold predictions about that, but there is likely to be um, some value there for you. On the equipment side, there's a, a long list of, of equipment that would be required. Um, you know, the budgets are in there uh, for all that stuff. You've got the relationships with those uh, equipment providers already as well because of the other activities uh, that you have in the city, including enforcement officers and others. So um, there's a budget and a plan in there for all that stuff. And that stuff also has a, a capital replenishment cadence to it that we've built in a, an ongoing budget for. On the tech side, there's, there is no shared phone services now. Um, the, the phones are there. One of the things the city will have to do is 
deploy uh, approximately another 100 cell phones, um, which you've got um, all those relationships and providers in place. Um, there are shared hardware elements in, inside your current attachment right now, though. The plan is to re replace the existing RCMP uh, hardware and network. Um, there's a multi-year plan inside, and there's some details on some of the budgets for that when we get to the cost piece. Um, software requirements are, are fairly straightforward. Um, they include things like you will need increased Microsoft licenses, uh, Oracle licenses, etc., uh, to be able to meet the need of what will ultimately be municipal employees now, not RCMP. Uh, and the network is, is similar to the hardware. There's, there's both elements in there, and uh, that system would be replaced with new equipment and connections to meet, to meet your network needs going forward. Um, we've included quite a bit of detail here on some of the systems, only because I think it, they're important. Uh, I won't spend a ton of time on them, but your records management system, so it's, it's the key uh, data warehouse police use to track um, all the records they maintain over time over folks. Um, the RCMP uses a system called PROS, at least the RCMP uh, west of BC. Uh, PROS is built off a platform called Niche. Um, the RCMP in BC actually use a different program called Prime, which is built off of Versaterm, which are the two major RMS providers in Canada. Um, so the plan that we've put together maintains the use of PROS. Um, again, it, it is niche-based, so it's very familiar to lots of folks, um, including those that you would be employing. Um, and again, we, we foresee having enforcement services outreach everybody move on to that system, so you're all using one system, which is not occurring today. Uh, your CAD system or your computer-aided dispatch, you already have this in place because of fire and uh, your public safety answering point, your 911 answering point. All those elements are in place, all the mapping's done, all those things are in place. So um, you, you would be adding folks uh, to the system, but not necessarily uh, uh, huge amounts of equipment to be able to do that. Um, there is a requirement to uh, access CPIC or the Canadian Police Information Centre. Uh, it's a national sharing system that is um, managed by the RCMP uh, on behalf of all law enforcement partners across Canada. Um, and it, it's uh, the system that uh, amalgamates all of those RMS systems across um, the country. There's quite a, quite a few more here that we've, we've added. There's, there is plans in, uh, inside the report to access all these things, including criminal intelligence service, uh, the National Sex Offender Registry, V-Class, um, all those pieces of the puzzle, there is a plan in place for all of those. Um, evidence management systems, you know, related to your RMS systems are, are software packages that help police services collect and manage and share and um, keep the continuity of, of evidence that they have. Uh, including digital evidence, which, which is becoming uh, a much more important part than the physical evidence element nowadays. So, so timeline-wise, um, as I mentioned, we've we've really got a, a five-year plan here. You know, in 2023, we've got you know the establishment of the commission. As I mentioned, it's really the first piece of the puzzle. Um, we've talked about policies and procedures. Um, we've assumed the police association would occur very early on as well. And, and as I mentioned, the other main um, task of the commission out of the gate is to hire the chief of police. Um, we've put a timeline in there. I think it's about four or four months or so to do that. Um, we've not made any assumptions on what the commission would do, but we've, we've wanted to put in enough time there uh, to be able to do a, a national you know, third-party search to be able to find, to find the right candidate. Uh, in 2024, we have the first uh, municipal officers deployed, uh, 41 municipal police officers trained and deployed, 31 peace officers, which, which uh, exist today. Um, and then you have that combination of municipal and RCMP officers sharing in that, in that work during that transition plan. Um, every year you have the ability in your municipal policing agreement to tell the RCMP how many police officers that you would like, and that's the mechanism in which we would draw that number down while, while you add your municipal police officers. And then that expansion really continues out you know, through 2025, 2026, and, and 2027 until um, you reach your, your full 
uh, capacity, at, or at least what we've forecasted with 100 um, municipal police officers and 31 peace officers. Um, it's possible it could go quicker than that. Some of that is is dependent on recruiting and, and other um, governance and, and legislative requirements, but we want it to you know be fairly conservative and, and give a window that made sense and had a bit of wiggle room in it if you needed it, but it, it is possible it could occur faster than that. So on to the cost of that. The way we've um, displayed it here in this table is, is to show the cost of the municipal police service model, including the transition elements, and compare it against an estimate of the same RCMP model going over those same years and then taking the difference between the two. The reason for that is there are multiple, uh, particularly human resources inside of that transition plan that are kind of hard to extricate, which, which ones are the transition ones and which ones are the policing ones. So we felt this was the easiest way to demonstrate it, was to run the two side by side and, and show the difference as the transition costs. Um, we have kept the escalation of those, the, the, the quote unquote inflation of those, the same in both models, assuming they're both um, operating in the same market and would be subject to the same market pressures. Um, so they're escalated at 2%. They also assume the same amount of officers and peace officers uh, across across those. So if you take those years and you add them up, you, you come up with your $19 million. Inside of those transition costs, and, and I've got a slide here that has more detail on it, includes 20% um, contingency as well. <laughs> You know, I think in general we've been fairly conservative in our estimates, as we are apt to be. Um, however, you know, we are also not naive to the fact that things could pop up that that we haven't been prepared for, or you might not be prepared for. So we've added a 20% contingency in that number as well. Here is some of that detail, and you can see the contingency at the bottom. So. Um, you know, we've got all the way from new officer equipment costs, and we've done that on a per officer basis, which is pretty common. We've drawn upon uh, several data points to do that, you know, both the, the things you're familiar with, like the RCMP, but we've also, um, you know, used some other information that we've, we've gathered over the years on, on the cost of those things. Uh, vehicle fleet, as I mentioned, in these five years is inside of that number. In year six, when you move to the transition phase, that moves to capital, um, which I think shows on the next slide. And then you've got kind of the combination of technology and, and the dispatch upgrades. And as I mentioned, that dispatch would move then from NAOCC to here locally, and, and that cost covers um, the equipment and upgrades that have to be done to accommodate that. Recruiting has both hard costs in it for recruiting, so not the people costs, um, but the hard costs of attending job fairs or travel. It also has a budget in there for things like relocation and, and any kind of bonuses you might have to uh, offer folks to entice them. Um, obviously, officer training. I mentioned the temporary office space that would be required to um, house those folks during that transition. Uh, we've got some some uh, other transition costs in there. And then, you know, a, a professional services category that we know the pieces of it, but we didn't define uh, at this point, they could include things like legal services, et cetera. They'll also likely include things like um, governance training for commission and those kinds of things could be in, uh, included in that budget. And then, as I mentioned, we've, we've added a 20% contingency in there as well. So this is the the you know the five-year transition and then the year six um, you know, the, the year where, where you would be into a municipal service. So, um, you know, included in there, as it, as it says, is all the police pay, operating, et cetera. Uh, it includes, um, you know, the, the transition costs, as I mentioned, you know, those RCMP costs will go down over that period of time, but they're, they're included in there as well. Uh, and then those are escalated at 2%. We, we've left out um, some of the revenue elements, um, to, to just simplify the table a little bit, but um, particularly around automated traffic. Um, and then you'll see that transition. Year four, we've got the first um, capital cost. And again, that's related to some of the dispatch costs, the ongoing capital dispatch needs. Um, we've put those into the municipal service moving forward. And then in year six, you see the transition from those being startup costs to being your typical capital replenishment cadence.
So, uh, you know, in conclusion, again, you know, if you look back at the scope here, our, our role here hasn't been to provide advice to the city on what its decision should be. And our role here hasn't been to say, here's the good of this model and the bad of that one and vice versa. Some of that work's already been done. Um, our role here was really to create the plan. Um, if you should choose to go down that path, what, what does the plan look like? And I think in conclusion, you know, the plan that has been created, I think addresses uh, many, if not all of the elements that folks have brought up they were concerned about, including elements around governance and how does that work. Again, some of that is quite prescriptive, but um, all those frameworks are in place for you. Um, you know, training, we've got uh, as robust a training plan as, as anybody else has across the country. Um, in, in addition, you'll be able to do that locally uh, and not have folks do that elsewhere in the country. Um, you know, from a modernization point of view, you have got a fairly modern model where you've got a tiered service delivery model that has different folks addressing different elements of your community safety needs, but all under the same command structure. Um, it also affords you a bit of nimbleness, I think, that at times, certainly we've heard reports, maybe uh, is challenging in, in your current paradigm. Um, and from a cost point of view, you know, uh, cost isn't always the most important element, but it is an element. And certainly, you know, based on our projections, they are very cost comparable. So, um, you know, so there, there is ultimately a really solid plan in place that meets all your legal and regulatory requirements and will meet your needs going forward. And I think the other point is, you know, I, I mentioned our role here as being objective and independent. I think at times we've pushed the transition team here. Uh, fairly hard on a couple of pieces of the puzzle, uh, parts that we maybe disagreed with or didn't understand, and, and um, they have uh, been able to, I think, come up with excellent answers and excellent answers to all those questions um, when we push them on it. And frankly, I think you've got, you know, the most knowledgeable <laughs> team about, about these transitions at this point in, in the province of Alberta, that's for sure. So um, should you decide to go down this path, I think you've got the team that can do it. So. Perfect. Thank you, you want, for that. Uh, uh, yeah, Mr. Manuel, you're going to continue before we do co questions, correct? That's correct. I think it uh, it makes sense now just uh, for flow sure. to, um, you know, I want to avoid duplication and presentation. So I think at this point, I'll just introduce the staff report and um, some conclusion slides and uh, we'll move into questions. Okay. So as was indicated, the report received here today, the transition plan from MNP really represents uh, a step in this process. And it takes us all the way back to when this began, which was city budget 2021. So ultimately council allocated funding within budget 2021 to complete a police service model review. The intent of that review well, really, the review was initiated for these primary reasons. The first was the province was assessing and continues to assess a provincial police service in replacement of the RCMP. And if the province proceeded, the RCMP would no longer be available to be a municipal contract policing provider for the city. Further, recent citizen satisfaction surveys have identified for several years that public perception of crime was negatively impacting citizens' sense of safety. Third, the police and expenditures in the city are the most expensive annual operating expense and consist of approximately 22% of our operating budget. As such, good governance and management practices necessitate periodic in-depth assessment and evaluation of those services. So that triggered about February of last year is when the launch of the, the terms of reference for what was the first phase of this project called the Police Service Model Review was undertaken. It uh, was an internally led exercise that uh, brought some in-house subject matter experts together. And that group went about doing the current state assessment and ultimately a multi-jurisdictional scan of both benchmark communities within RCMP jurisdictions and municipal policing jurisdictions. That report was delivered to Council in uh, late September, early October, where the following conclusion was drawn. Uh, 
that regardless of the decision pertaining to provincial policing, the city of Grand Prairie could potentially benefit from an alternative service provider by way of a municipal police service and that further analysis was recommended. That analysis uh, came by way of this third party review, which was just conducted and uh, delivered by MNP. So that ultimately leads us to where we are today. And in summary, where we are today is we've received both these reports. We have identified through living here, we're all well aware that Grand Prairie is a growing mid-sized city. It's vibrant, it has a diverse population, and we serve as a regional hub for over 280,000 people. And while the city is thriving in many metrics, crime and safety are frequently reported as top areas of concern for our residents. Crime data confirms the public perception that crime is an issue for our city and that crime severity indexes are higher than both provincial and national averages. It's administration's belief that Grand Prairie's reached a size in, in complexity whereby we have outgrown our current policing model. Of Canada's 100 largest municipalities, to which Grand Prairie is one of, the vast majority, over 79%, are policed by municipal or regional police services. That percentage is even higher if that municipality acts as a regional hub, whereby 85% are policed by municipal or regional services. It is believed and recognized in both the police service model review and the police transition report that MNT, MMP is presented here today that the following benefits exist. The first benefit identified is an increased local oversight, accountability, and efficiency offered through a local police commission and local decision-making autonomy. It would allow for police modernization free of historical encumbrances of a traditional organization. The Municipal Police Service is conceptually designed to provide a wide range of public safety services exceeding that of historical law enforcement and is positioned to evolve with society more nimbly. We believe there could be improved officer recruitment based on local candidate development and in-community police recruit training offered through a partnership with a leading police academy provider. We believe that overall financial transparency and viability would be improved. Community policing costs that are estimated to be similar to or possibly less than what is expected under continued contract policing. And enhanced public safety infrastructure through the local development of an integrated public safety communication center dispatch to serve all city first responders, a public safety real-time operations center to provide ongoing situational awareness of public safety in the city and surrounding areas, in the addition of new local specialized policing capability in the form of an emergency response team, uh, also called a tactical unit, embedded within the police service. Therefore, it's administration's recommendation that this matter be referred to a future council meeting and that council pending confirmation of transition funding support Direct administration to take all steps necessary to proceed towards an alternative police service provider through the establishment of a municipal police service in accordance with the policing transition report and that notice be provided to the government of Canada of such uh, in accordance with the terms of the municipal police service agreement. So I'm sure we'll have plenty of questions to discuss now. Absolutely. Thank you to both of you for your reports. I will open it up to question uh, for, from Council. Um, please use your cue and be respectful that many people will have questions. So if we can keep it to one question, if there's an opportunity for a um, follow-up on that topic, 
that's appropriate, but uh, uh, let's go through everybody's questions and have a uh, fair time for everybody to have conversation. Councillor Bosch. Thank you, Mayor Clayton. Thank you for this. This was uh, significant. Um, I guess my first question, among many, would be, many people would say the real issue is with the crime, with crime is the justice system thereafter, so the catch and release issues, um, and not necessarily the RCMP. How is a municipal police force going to deal with um, the issues of the catch and release in the justice system? So I'm, I'm going to pick who I think on each one, and if it's the opposite person, feel free to jump in, but I'll turn the first one over to Mr. Manuel. Yeah, and I think Mr. Lins will be able to support this. So I, I would say that is a, a recognized challenge, that the relying on traditional approaches within the criminal justice system to deal with uh, issues of, of public safety, particularly related to crime, um, can be outside of the control of the police service at times. However, what's been developed here, and this is really the modernization approach, is a public safety agency that's not focused specifically on just engagement of the criminal justice system. That's where the balance of the outreach workers, the enhanced number of units related to the PAC teams, the uh, use of the peace officers, we see a path where the criminal justice system is certainly an available pathway, but it's not the only pathway that uh, investing in areas such as um, uh, alternative dispute resolution, uh, social services and counseling. It's it's really getting to addressing the community issue. And if the justice system's not the right path or an available path to do that, we have alternative approaches to take. And frankly, we have local control as to whether we want to engage those paths or not. All right. Uh, Councillor Bressy. Thank you, Mayor Clayton. Thank you, gentlemen. I uh, appreciate the work that went into this. I'm not aware of a report quite like this done anywhere in Canada. I certainly know that it hasn't been done in Alberta or in the city of Surrey where a transition is happening right now, so appreciate the setup. I'm trying to get an understanding of, um, for me, public safety is the number one outcome. That's the thing I'm most, con most concerned with and obsessed with, but I'm confident if we recruit a good commission and they recruit a good chief and he recruits good people, we'll get those safety outcomes. So for me, I want to ask some questions about budget. We've got a number of tables in here that I'm sure are just summary tables of a lot of big spreadsheets. And I appreciate not getting all those big spreadsheets, but I'm trying to figure out how deep you went to model this. So could you give me a bit of an overview of how you came to these summary numbers that we're seeing? Uh, sure, you are correct. It is built from scratch in uh, some spreadsheets that probably quite boring to most folks. Um, you know, we've shared those with the transition team as well, so they have that detail. You know, it, it is it is down to, as we mentioned, you know, how many how many CEWs at, at a cost of X, how many, you know, hats, toques, mitts, you know, like it's it, it is that detailed. Again, much of that information is fairly well known and and because of the work you know my team does across the country we we see quite a bit of it so we're able to not only draw on uh, things locally but from from other um, jurisdictions as well to use those as as um, you know double checks or or you know kind of interjurisdictional research as it were so uh, it is built at a fairly granular level as I mentioned the transition team has that I don't know if there's how, how much of a plan there is to share the nauseating detail with you, but but it is absolutely there. Yeah, and maybe just to expand that on that a little bit, uh, two advantages we have when it comes to uh, our approach towards this is we have the knowns of our current RCMP expenditures at a fairly granular level locally. So we, we know what we're spending on pens and pencils and those sorts of things. Um, as it pertains to the existing policing operation. And further, we specifically identified regional benchmark communities of similar size and complexity that have services about the size of what we were looking to develop. And when we break down what their, we, frankly, we have access to all their budgets and saw how we stacked up against them. And uh, the, the budget that's actually put forth as uh, projected 
actually represents a, a greater expenditure than all of those um, other municipalities. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I just wanted to advise Council we will be taking a break at 12.15 and for those who are watching. Um, but I will continue in the queue until then. Uh, Councillor O'Connor. Thank you, Mayor Clayton. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thank you, Chad and, and Chris. Um, uh, it took me four and a half hours to read this report, so very intensive. I don't know if I should have went to that detail, but I did. Uh, and uh, I just want to, uh, and Councillor Bressy mentioned about uh, Surrey, and can you explain to us uh, the concern? Because I'm, I do, and the rest of Council does, and our community is concerned about uh, Surrey and what happened there. What is the difference between what happened in Surrey and what's happening here? So, sure, uh, maybe I'll start and then uh, Mr. Linz, if he has anything to add, can uh, build upon that. So it, it is important to note that the policing models and the legislation that governs them is different between provinces. And, and BC has a different approach than, than Alberta does, as do their municipal politics. It's a little different as well. The biggest difference with Surrey is Surrey started with a decision to, following a, a municipal election, to form a municipal police service. And what followed that was then the subsequent reports on how they would do that. The big difference in this model is we started with a service delivery review, not to create a municipal police service, but to assess what our current state was. Following the current state, council deemed it appropriate to assess what a transition would look like, which has been presented here today. And I would say this council is gonna be well informed as to um, what the various implications are ahead of making that decision at a future council meeting. Mr. Linz, anything to add? No, I would do exactly what I was gonna say. Perfect. Mr. O'Connor, does that answer your question? Yes, it does. Now I have follow-up questions later. Thank you. All right. Councillor Blackmore. Uh, thank you, Mayor Clayton. Um, so I, I had a number of questions, which I did email you, and I'm not going to ask you those today because um, I've come up with another slate of questions. Um, I am curious about um, housing police officers and housing uh, 911. Um, when uh, the current RCMP building was built was 2005, and uh, it was expected at that time that there would be another building built, certainly before now. And um, so instead of doing that, um, police services have been provided out of city on 99th, and I believe are now going to transfer to the building formerly known as the Stonebridge. Um, I'm wondering if, I didn't see anything in the plan that would indicate an increase in building space over the next uh, six years. And I'm wondering if you believe we truly have the physical capacity to house um, this transition, including what I'm assuming will be additional 911 operators. Mr. Manuel? So that's a, a fair question. Uh, so there's a couple of things at play. So one of the things is the current RCMP detachment also presently houses the rural contingent of RCMP officers that uh, uh, while operating out of the building are, are funded and operationally directed um, and to support the county of Grand Prairie. The hamlet of Claremont has hit a population threshold of that, that magic 5,000 number and is now responsible for having a municipal police contract. That will see the, the county is actively planning right now a, uh, a build for a police station in Claremont, which would see those provincial resources moved out of our existing uh, RCMP detachment. And that's going to happen regardless of whether this proceeded as a municipal service or, or as a RCMP contract. That is going to free up some space within the building. However, much like the current state, we will still need some auxiliary space which, uh, like you said, presently is accommodated at City on 99, but uh, we have done some, as a project team, initial planning, and we do believe we have existing facilities to accommodate. The, um, it's gonna require some shuffling around, but uh, we believe we have the existing facilities to accommodate um, the transitional workforce. 
there may become a day where the police service, regardless of whether it's RCMP or municipal, is going to require another facility. But we don't think that whether it's municipal or RCMP is really going to um, be a deciding factor one way or the other. It's If it's needed, it's going to be required for either. And 911 services are currently housed out of the South Fire Hall, I believe. Originally, that was a built... Uh, that they did do police dispatch from there as well. Uh, that's since gone to Edmonton. So I'm wondering, is the space big enough? And how how many people do you think you need to add to um, beef up the service we're getting? So we project that we'd be adding two additional dispatchers per shift to support the, the policing function uh, to their existing complement right now. That being said, um, Yes, it would be a tight squeeze over there. So we've we've been in discussions. There's there's a couple ways that this can be approached. We can house everybody together. We can share infrastructure and house the police dispatchers in a in a different part of the city than the fire nine one one dispatchers. Or we've also had discussions around uh, what does alternative space look like. So uh, I would say fire dispatch at a, is at a decision point right now. Anyways, where they've likely outgrown their space. So it, it's. Again, it's kind of on the table, regardless of which model we pursue. It's going to be a conversation that's going to have to come forward to council. Great. Thanks for that. Councillor Berg. Thank you, Mayor Clayton, and thank you, gentlemen. Um, so one of the things I just want to comment first is thank you for addressing where the alligators might be hidden, because no transition, no, doesn't matter what project you work on, there will be some some issues coming up and so on pages 100 102 you address many of those and i appreciate that because again we talk about financial contingencies but also there will be resource contingencies too and those are addressed in there so thank you so much for that um one of the things that i didn't see in the report and it's not critical but it's more curious and even follows up to some measure on councillor blackmore's last point is currently a lot of these jobs that the City of Grand Prairie is paying through the RCMP are in Edmonton and in Ottawa. How many of those jobs will now come to our community? Yeah, so, yeah, Chris, Chris has just mentioned 12. It, there's, um, I think we've got the, the budget for that support services group is about four and a half million dollars, if I recall, and I think we estimate about three million of that would likely get captured to the greater degree so that is split across a couple of areas um, namely the national recruiting program which which uh, recruits our CMP officers in the depot um, the cadet training program which of course happens at depot in Regina and then um, corporate services division which is HR finance etc uh, and some administration folks which coincidentally is across the street from me in Winnipeg uh, in downtown Winnipeg is where those folks are housed so that that's been our estimate of what that ultimately would look like but and yeah. then you'd also mentioned training as well that that would happen here correct mr. Manuel yeah that, that's correct and so as far as brand new FTEs that we believe have to come on board that wouldn't have to come on board if we had the RCMP model was the is about 12 that being said we've anticipated that we presently support two systems so the municipal employees the 58 municipal employees we have uh, supporting the rcmp today they're they're really supporting two systems you got the city system you got the rcmp system we believe there's efficiency that exists within that and when we compare our civilian numbers to that of civilian numbers at our benchmark municipalities we we actually greatly exceed them. So we think there's a, a lot of opportunity within that um, to absorb the, any additional stuff that we haven't fully considered, although we think we have a robust consideration and plan for the functions re that are required. As was mentioned, it's not that we're not going to spend the $4.5 million in indirect costs that get spent outside the community today. We believe we can repatriate somewhere in the $3 million mark of that. But it's going to be local economic activity with people that are employed and working in the city versus in some of the hubs, such as uh, either Edmonton, Winnipeg, or Ottawa. All right. Thanks, gentlemen. Great. Uh, thank you for that. Councillor Thiessen. 
Thank you very much, Mayor Clayton. Uh, I have many, many questions on this, uh, and I think it's largely from the work that you guys, gentlemen, did and the people with MMP, MMP. So thank you very much for all that. Um, so one of the, I'll only ask one right now, but one of our main motions is that uh, pending confirmation of transition funding support, that we will move forward with this. So with the cost being at $19 million over, stretched over five years for transition support that we may be looking for, how much transition support is actually available to us if we choose to go down this path? So that's a, a fair question for me. So ultimately what we did is we wanted to make sure that if we were putting forward a plan that we were putting forward a plan that considered all the available funding sources for that plan. So one of the first considerations we had is the province as a, a partner and as far as the constitution goes the province is responsible for policing in its, in its um, jurisdiction. So we believe that was a prudent place to start. So we've put forward a request for the entire startup and, and transition funding over a multi-year period, which uh, we, our request was over five years for the, the 19. Okay, so we've asked, we've asked for all of it. That's correct. And we anticipate a funding decision prior to council having to make a go or no go decision on this. So um, that's why the recommendation is based. We recognize that uh, we could not do the startup and transition without a tax implication um, or a, a longer amortization of borrowed funds to, um, to bring this to fruition. So with that said, one of the pieces of feedback we got in the public consultation was there was broad general support or a feeling of indifference to one model or the other, with the exception of tax implication. So we are very alive to that. And uh, that's why we made the request to the province to understand what financial commitment will exist there. Uh, may I just have one follow up to that answer? Sure, I just I wanted to remind you, Councillor Thiessen, as you are aware, well, Council has advocated to the provincial government for funding in this transition the entire time. And we're optimistic to hear an announcement from the province shortly. Great. That's, uh, that was actually my next question. Uh, so uh, before all this gets commenced, if Council were to choose to, uh, when do we anticipate uh, the funding response, uh, whether or not we got it, all of it, or some of it? Uh, we believe that we're going to hear back shortly from the province, and uh, I suspect ahead of Council making a decision whether to proceed or not to proceed with this. Yeah, to be fair, um, the province is well aware that this information is required um, from councils, in council's opinion, prior to making a decision. Yeah, I was just hoping I'd get a date, but that's okay. Nothing before the budget, I guess. Councillor Bosch. Thank you, Mayor Clayton. Mm. Uh, in speaking with a lot of our residents, one of the main topics that comes up is training. And we can say, as you alluded to, that we have you know, top-notch training if we go with the municipal police force. How do you assure the residents that that is accurate and that the training will be as good if, or hopefully better even, than depot? And the second part to that question is, if we do training here, um, is there a, a possibility to train RCMP officers regionally in our hub? <laughs> So, yeah, maybe we'll start with it. So sure. uh, around credentialing and in ensuring the quality of the training, the police service in, in all aspects of its operations, and training being one of them, has to meet the provincial policing standards. The provincial policing standards largely parallel the federal policing standards, which the RCMP develop. Um, to your point, the big difference between municipal police training and the RCMP police training is when you go to depot, you have a, a cohort of candidates that are going to different communities in different provinces. Therefore, there's a very general approach to, well, frankly, a police officer enforces federal laws, provincial laws, and municipal laws. Well, when you're at depot, you don't do provincial laws and you don't do municipal laws because you're not going to cover every province, you're not going to cover every community. A municipal service will have that focus. 
Additionally, when it comes to things like uh, cultural diversity, inclusion, again, there is an emphasis placed on that at Depot, but there's regional and local differences that exist, you know, pertaining to uh, Aboriginal history and those sorts of things. Again, we would really focus on a on a local delivered course. You'd really want to focus on your specific community and uh, and what's presented there. Uh, further, I think that's where we talk about what's suggested in the model here is not the development of an in-house course. It's really partnering with an organization that's delivering this training today at a high standard and uh, and has a, a good track record of doing so. And uh, maybe I'll just pass it to Chad. Where would that be? Mr. Lenz? So, sorry, what was the question? Where would you what be? The training is with a different organization or with an organization of high standards. Yeah. Where is that organization? So there's an existing post-secondary institution in Alberta that's delivering training for s multiple police agencies. And we've initiated um, discussion with that and they've agreed that it's, it's certainly something that, um, that they want to pursue with us and they would be willing to deliver it here. And we have costing as to what the expenditures of that would be. One of the benefits that we see with local recruitment, or sorry, not local recruitment, in local training, is it allows for better local recruitment because a person that has to take six months of their life and spend it in another province, in another community, well, if you're a single parent and you don't have a very, very strong family support network, that's not a career possibility for you. Under this model, it's, it's a Monday to Friday job where you go for training and uh, you can accommodate more candidates that would otherwise be excluded. Yeah. And the cost of training, um, bringing somebody in from this other organization, is significantly lower, is, is, is what we've been hearing. How do, you, how do you address the cost difference? Mr. Manuel? No, that's, that's fair. I, I wanted to actually say, so... It depends on how many officers you have on a course. So the more officers on the course, the more cost effective it is. Um, based on the projection of approximately 12 recruits per class, it is a more cost effective model than what even our share of depot costs are today. Again, one of the reasons being to operate depot, they have to essentially house, feed, and provide facilities for all of those uh, recruits. Here, they feed themselves, they house themselves, and we just deliver the core training curriculum. And travel. Travel's a big one. Tra travel's a big one too. Sending people to Regina is, is, is not cheap. To your point, RCMP officers would unlikely train, as far as recruit training goes, at a Grand Prairie Police Academy law enforcement training facility. However, there could be opportunity as it pertains to um, continual education, requalifications, development, use of facilities, those sorts of things. Those opportunities do exist. And the option for agencies like the Lakeshore Regional Police, which is a First Nations police service uh, north of Slave Lake, they presently send people to Edmonton. They used to go to Regina. You know, there's an opportunity to perhaps partner with them as well. If in the future with this training aspect, if the federal government decides to pull out totally, uh, which is potentially an issue that we are looking at in the future. Would that open up some doors um, then to do that cooperative training piece? Well, one thing, if they did that, the province would uh, require provincial police training. Presently, the infrastructure that exists within the province of Alberta to support that right now uh, it would likely take some time to launch and scale up, you know, their own training facility. And they would likely look to partner with organizations such as ourselves and Edmonton, Calgary, Lethbridge, and so on to accommodate that. So I'd say there's good opportunity there. Don't forget, we also have peace officers, we have sheriffs, we have conservation officers. Every, there's lots of people that have training needs, and there is not a plentiful amount of infrastructure to support it. Have you done a cost analysis on that? Difference? Sorry, I'm going to, I'm going to, had about six, so I've been All pretty, yeah, <laughs> I'm going to move on for the, a little bit. Councillor Bressy. Sorry. Great. Uh, thank you. Um, so 
something I'm thinking through a lot is uh, commission. It's one of the big benefits of a potential municipal force. It's also if we don't get great community members signing up for that commission, it's one of the biggest risks of a, of a municipal force. I'm curious if you've got a recommendation on if we start a commission, what size that commission should be. Mr. Lenz? Yeah, so I, I think you're right. You know, Councilor Berg mentioned alligators. I think getting the commission right is a big is a big deal. You know, it's your opportunity to really set the foundation for what the organization looks like going forward. And of course, that group of folks is then tasked with hiring your first chief of police, which of course will be integral to you know what the leadership of that organization looks like going forward. So. Uh, agree, it's a big deal. Size-wise, you know, again, there is some prescriptive elements inside of the Police Act about uh, how big it can be, and then the the component of uh, the city element in that. So there's some openness to that. Here would be my, I won't give you a number, but my recommendation would be to begin with to start smaller than bigger, to have it not be unwieldy. You know, um, I think if I remember correctly, you're allowed up to 12. I, I would argue 12 is too big, <laughs> particularly in the beginning where you're going to be uh, required to be, I think, quite nimble. Um, so that, you know, without giving you a number, I would recommend starting smaller. You can always grow uh, as the as, um, organization matures, but I, I would recommend starting smaller than bigger. Go ahead, Councilor Bressy. Something I'm trying to figure out is I'm looking at that transition timeline and when we're talking about full-time paid staff, sure, we could give an aggressive timeline. I am a little bit concerned about the timeline. It looks like a lot of work for community members to get up speed and especially how quickly we need to hire that chief. That chief. Um, curious if you've figured out yet what the time commitment of a commission member would look like, especially in that first year That we and how realistic is it that we're going to be able to find that it, that when we find good community members, they're going to be able to meet the timeline we need. About how many meetings do we need, or like what kind of work have you done to figure out how achievable the timeline for the commission is, Mr. Sh uh, Mr. Manuel? Yeah, I'd say the transition team, in consultation with uh, existing commissions and understanding what their their legislative requirements are. So there is a lot of prescription to existing laws and regulations as towards their function, their form, their policies, their procedures. So the transition team has created draft policy and procedure for consideration as placeholder for the commission, understanding that, um, you know, the capacity and the timelines um, or considerations. A typical commission and an operating police service meets once a month. The, we forecast that in the early days, it's more frequent, likely twice a month with the ability to call special meetings uh, as required. I think what's critical to this is the executive director. The executive director is going to be able to do a ton of preparatory work for a commission. So really they are, they are receiving direction from the commission as far as the development of what needs to be developed. And further, they are they're also um, essentially prepping material for decision as opposed to, um, you know, seeking a ton of direction per se. Um, there also is obviously a training commitment uh, early on. I, training to onboard a new commission, I would say probably 40 hours. Um, between 40 and 80 hours over the course of the year, probably 40 hours initially and, and maybe 80 hours over the course of the upcoming year. But once that's there, it's there. The Alberta Association of Police Governance has an annual, um, does have an annual conference and uh, in AGM, which uh, I'm sure we'd be a part of and uh, additional continuing education is provided there. And uh, well, thank you. And certainly is a really fascinating opportunity for our community members to have a big impact on the community and really hone their own skills and experience. So big opportunity for people in the community if we do this. And to that point, I don't think it's been indicated that they can, that the members only need to be community members. There are opportunities for external members to be part of the commission as well. Councillor O'Connor. Yes, uh, thank you, Mayor Clayton. <clears throat> as a contractor, I was looking at your contingency numbers on 
leasing space, I think 250,000 a year. And I'm curious, I didn't see a line item that talks about the renovations that would go into that lease space or the IT costs that would go in to do that. Is there another line item somewhere else that you've allowed for these contingencies? Mr. Manuel? So as far as like leasehold improvement goes, um, we pre-identified space that uh, does not require the, the leasehold improvement uh, component and to which the IT infrastructure, the, the space, that's only really to accommodate the transition team and the non-operational policing officers. So we're talking about a, a total of about 12 people. So it, it's not like we're taking 58 municipal police officers and we're saying this is your police department. No, this is really just office space for the people that are like me writing reports and doing budgets and doing contract negotiations. And um, th that's just the place for them to rest their hat. The folks, the way that the police officers are operational, they would essentially be secondments into the the RCMP police in operation until such time as it flips and the municipal police uh, are operating their headquarters out of the uh, RCMP detachment. Thank you. Councillor Blackmore. Um, thank you. Um, I have one quick follow-up question about Councillor Bressy's concerns with a commission. Would commissioners receive uh, any kind of payment? Mr. Manuel. So the act permits it, completely a council decision. Yep. Okay. Um, that is something to think about. Another thing you talked about in uh, the transition plan is the need for a senior executive advisor, HR advisor, communications, IT specialist, legal counsel, et cetera. Would we be drawing f those skills from people that are already on staff at the city in different departments such as HR, or would we need uh, solely dedicated specialists to the transition team? Mr. So Manuel. we've budgeted them to be solely dedicated resources supplemented by the larger organization. So for instance, human resources, technically all employees, you, you have to, every province is a little bit different. BC is different than Alberta, but in Alberta, the term police department is actually rather appropriate because it's really a service area of the city. All of the employees, the police officers, the peace officers, the, they're, they're all city of Grand Prairie employees. So although we have a human resources position allocated to support just the volume of people that would exist there, the they would have interface with the city's chief human resources officer. Same goes with finance. On the finance side, the CFO is the CFO for the police service. I see Ms. Whiteway nodding, so I don't know if she has something to add or not. No. Okay, that's good. Thank you. Councillor Berg. Yeah, thank you, Mayor Clayton. So one of the, the reasons that, you know, I'm seriously considering this in favor is we need to transition. And when you look at a place like Edmonton, the, the, the public is calling for more resources like PAC teams, etc. And so when I look at the, uh, the hiring chart here, which is on page 82 to 86, <clears throat> I see packed at the bottom of 82, but I don't see any positions aligned with that. Those spaces are blank. Um, so that's one of the things that I want to see is if we do do this, let's do it right to what the community is asking for as far as PAC teams. So that's, I guess, question 1A, but then 1B, um, you mentioned a tactical unit, which seems opposite of, of what the real goal here is with um, trauma-informed policing. So can you address those? Yeah, so twofold. Uh, within the conceptual model, we actually have four four pack teams with the idea of providing 24 hour a day um, service coverage. Or, so again, that's gonna be the decision of the chief of police on the deployment model, but our intent is to enhance the number of, of pack teams. We have two presently, we'd like to go to four. The psychiatric nurse component of that comes from Alberta Health Services. So there'd have to be further discussion and dialogue there. We've pre-planned the policing allocation on that side. Now, to your point on the, the tactical unit, now it's not a full-time tactical unit. That's they, it's essentially what would be a secondary duty of the um, 
of the assigned members. And really it's the, having the equipment and the training available that when a, a significant public safety incident arises, that we have the, the tools in the training to respond to it in a more expedient manner. Certainly the RCMP have very robust capability in this area, but it comes from Edmonton. And a, and a call out can be an eight hour, you know, an eight hour delay. So the vast majority of tactical work is really, that includes your crisis negotiators, that includes the de-escalation. It's, it, it's not, you know, shooting down the door and, and come in. Like there's a place for that if it had to happen, but the vast majority of it is really more uh, crisis negotiation, de-escalation, non-lethal means of resolving incidents. Thank you. I'm just going to jump in the queue for a quick question on this similar vein. Can you tell me, uh, Mr. Manuel, where you see opportunities operationally in regards to the municipal police force working with our very successful mobile outreach team? Yeah, this is where the mirroring up and breaking down some of the silos related to just having different management under different organizations and different operating protocols um, ha has benefit. If if we see, for instance, and, and this is what we like about the proposed model, is once we're receiving one call center that's getting all of these complaints, not complaints, but uh, calls for service are being received, they can initially be triaged there based on defined um, protocols and, and work rules. And if they hurt, hit certain definitions, it could show that maybe we need more outreach workers, maybe we need more peace officers. It, it, it's really deploying the right resource to the right call and not just sending a police officer because somebody called the police line or sending an outreach worker because somebody called the outreach worker line. So we see it as an ability to right size the organization with the appropriate personnel. Um, one of the unique factors you'll see with this design, if you were to compare it to a traditional police service, we have more civilian staff than we do police officer staff as a, as a volume of the police service. Now, we still have the same number of police officers that we do. We're not deteriorating that, but we're surrounding them with more response options. Great. Thank you for that. Councillor Bosch. Thank you. Okay. Now I'll ask my last question on that. <laughs> I'll hold this and won't hold this hostage. So have we done a cost analysis in regards to training and travel, shelter, food versus having a training experts coming here and equipment? Mr. Manuel? Yes. So uh, s simply put, if, if I'm just giving you a comparison to use, if we were to send officers, there, there's several providers in Edmonton, Calgary, we could send them to Ontario, we could send them to Regina. It's approximately $30,000 to $40,000 per officer to put them on somebody else's course. And then you have to worry about their, their housing, their food. None of that is included within there. So the costing we have on the local provided course is, is a significant uh, improvement under that model. Now where it flips is say we get to year seven and we only have two, three recruits a year. Well, at that point, we, we probably, re, not probably, we do reassess and you may partner with an Edmonton police service, for instance, for those, those two or three folks. But one of the things that happens down south with uh, Lethbridge, Medicine Hat, Blood Tribe, those police services, is they run a cohort together. So one will put three, one will put one, one will put you know, four officers in, and that's how they build the class. So we see the opportunity to uh, do some of that as well. How do you do that? It's something to add? Sorry, I was just gonna add, and, and, and you are in a relatively unique position there, I think. Not every city has access to a track where you can do your evasive driving training and the ranges to be able to do firearms qualifications and the post-secondary institutions to be able to partner with for classrooms, et cetera. So you're not, not every city would have that option to do it locally. So it, 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 you're somewhat uniquely positioned in that regard. 
has this number, so this uh, cost analysis, been put into the five-year plan already, that cost savings? Well, it's included as an absolute, so it would show up in there as a net. We haven't netted it out specifically in any place, but we've taken the cost estimate from those service providers, and that is in your ongoing cost going forward. Compared to your your uh, historical legacy costs would have the other cost in it, which is really a per member cost allocation, more so than it is your actual direct cost to train your officers. Okay, if that makes sense. I do like the thirty thousand number that you're allocating, and then plus, you know, room and board and travel. I'm just curious how that aligns with the new potential plan, and I'll I'll ask that later privately. All right, Councillor O'Connor. Thank you, Mayor Clayton. Um, thank you. And this is a what if scenario at year three. You are not at your full complement of officers that you require how much flexibility in, in, is in the plan. And secondly, I notice that the current arrangement with the RCMP, the number is 110 and they're providing us 104 and you, this plan shows 100. So I'd like that answered, please. Mr. Manuel. So let me start with the, the second part of that, the, the positions. So you're right, the city has a 110 positions for police officers. We would regularly fund 104. However, you'll see within the report, there's a graph there. We've never had more than 98. So even at 100, 100 staff positions is still greater than 98, which is the most we've ever had, and it's more than we presently have. Um, so, um, so that's we picked a, a reasonable, a realistic number, which was the 100, um, to maintain policing at its current levels or projected current levels. The um, second part of your, or the first part of your question, I guess there. Um, Actually, it's just slipping on me again there, Council. Yes, if you don't meet your targets in, let's say, year three, what's your contingency plan? And will the RCMP say, oh, no, you made an agreement, sorry. Okay, no, that's, that's actually a great question. So it's important to note that the plan that's been put forward is the, is the conceptual plan to show viability. And there shouldn't be a lot of deviation from it because that's really what we're selling the community and it's what we're selling Council. That being said... There is a number of activities that need to occur following a decision to proceed where we have to essentially form a, a tri-party committee between us, uh, the provincial regulators and Public Safety Canada, where we really work out the details, create the MOUs, the contractual uh, obligations. One thing that was learned out of the Surrey process, and we do have the benefit of learning lessons from um, them as they they're the most recent people who have gone through this is we're looking at what's worked well and what hasn't worked well as part of that transition model and a lot of the common agreements the mous a lot of them have been developed and would be functional in our environment the one piece of advice we took from everybody involved was to be deliberate with timelines and specify dates so we have a projected date of becoming a police service jurisdiction in 2026. It's better to have the date and work it backwards than to not have a date and assume that you're just working towards whatever. And Surrey still doesn't have a date. So we want to establish a date and then we'll work with the partners to work backwards on that. Come year three, if we're not hitting the targets and council will be keenly aware of the targets because if this proceeds forward, there should be a, a monthly report coming back like on any major project from the commission indicating the status of the transition, you know, both key milestones and, uh, and likely financially as well. So uh, one thing that does exist is even if we don't have a municipal police service agreement, say our municipal police service agreement concluded in 2026 in accordance with the provisions of the agreement, the responsibility for policing in the province falls to the minister and the director of law enforcement. The director of law enforcement, they oversee the provincial police service contract, which today is with the, the RCMP. They have the ability 
not the ability, they have the responsibility to make sure a community is adequately policed. They can direct policing resources. No, they can also direct cost for those resources, right? But if, if we were short bodies, we would have the funding within the plan, but those bodies may be secondments from the provincial police service contract, for instance, right? That's just one scenario. Um, but there is contingencies to address and, uh, you know, if dates, everything's always subject to negotiation. Thank you. Good answer. Uh, I'm going to take Councillor Bressy's question and then we're going to take a break till 1.15. Thanks, Councillor Bressy. Go ahead. Great. <clears throat> Thank you. As I chat with members of the community, we've hit a lot of the top concerns that I'm hearing, especially around training and budget and those things. But one I do hear is... Uh, just concerns about if you switch to local police force, how do you protect against nepotism? How do you how do you how do you make sure that it's appropriately responsive to the com community in an above board board manner? Could you talk a little bit through what kind of accountability mechanisms you have and how the view of police has changed over the last couple decades about local versus national policing? Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of it comes back to that commission element. You know, you're you're really entering a paradigm where you have more civilian oversight in a municipal service than you than you currently have. Um, that's why that job is so important. And getting the right folks involved in it is very important uh, because they really provide. You know, they are the boss of of your chief of police ultimately. Um, you know, so finding the right folks to be able to do that is important. And I think you know what we have found over time is. It's not as important to get folks with a policing background or policing knowledge than it is to get people with really good governance knowledge, you know, that can can uh, maneuver around those elements of nepotism and other things that they may have to be faced with over time. Um, you know, having the ability to be nose in, fingers out, uh, yet, you know, maintaining very strategic mindset about where does the community want to go um, and having the, the chief of police and their team you know, develop the operational model to be able to get you there is more important than some of those other pieces. So um, that that is ultimately the mechanism that, that provides that for you. Let me just expand upon that a little bit because that's absolutely correct. But there's oversight of the commission as well, right? The commission has to operate under the provincial legislation. Both the commission and the police service are subject to external audits, which uh, occur on a reoccurring frequency. And um, further to that, the Police Amendment Act that was passed back in December created in Alberta an organization that's going to be called the uh, Police Review uh, Commission. That will actually take all the internal police conduct investigations away from the police services that's right. and will see an independent investigator outside the police uh, receive the public complaints and also investigate and adjudicate the public complaints. So, um, you know, if there's concerns that exist about police conduct in the community, they're going to be reviewed externally and the adjudication of them will be done externally. Excellent. Thank you. Great. Thank you. So for those who are watching, we are going to take a break till 1.15. Uh, thank you for this conversation and I'll leave the queue as is. Councillor Blackmore, you'll be up first when we come back. Thanks so much. See you soon.
Ooh. Good afternoon and welcome back to the special council meeting of February 21st. Uh, we will continue where we left off, uh, which is in the question portion of our um, committee meeting. And I have a full queue. Uh, next in the queue is Councillor Blackmore. Thank you, Mayor Clayton. Um, one of the concerns that has been raised to me is um, how would we manage um, a major crime that's multi-jurisdictional? Um, I know we have a process in place for that currently, and I know that municipal forces across Alberta have procedures in place to handle that situation. Um, but Chris, could you just walk us through how that works and uh, maybe put our minds to ease there? Yeah, certainly. So. It should be noted that obviously during the first few years of the transition, the, the RCMP continued to be the police service of jurisdiction and the processes that exist today would continue to exist. Now, following the complete transition, it is uh, identified in the organization conceptual organization chart, the major crimes capability to address the vast majority of um, serious crimes, person's crimes that would uh, occur within the uh, policing jurisdiction of the city. That being said, as you'd mentioned, sometimes there is investigations that are, are more complex and involve uh, you know other provinces, other cities, other policing jurisdictions. In those instances, um, because policing uh, has existed in Canada for you know well over a century, there is uh, really well-defined um, uh, protocols for being able to uh, support those multi-jurisdictional efforts. There's a really strong spirit of collaboration between the uh, the policing partners. Uh, if it occurs within Alberta, it certainly could be something that the Provincial Police Service uh, has a lead in. And if it is something of significant national importance, uh, again, the RCMP is the Federal Police Service, uh, may assume carriage of that with uh, partners executing various uh, components of it. Uh, that being said, as you indicated, regardless of whether you're a police service that has 12 members in this province, which we have some of, all the way up to those that have over 3,000 members, um, certainly things can happen in any community at any time. And um, those, uh, peer relationships are, are critical and uh, we expected we'd be extended that, that same courtesy. And, and in that same vein, we currently have an alert office here um, and we have officers that I believe are seconded to that. Would that process continue so that um, regardless of what the provincial police force may look like in the future, that alert office will be running much the same? So that's actually a great point. So within El Grand Prairie and in the province of Alberta, we have the Alberta law enforcement response teams and they have a, a number of mandates, but a big one is organized crime and uh, dealing with multi-jurisdictional uh, investigations. The, the way it works in uh, communities such as Medicine Hat in Lethbridge, which have uh, alert offices and also have um, uh, city police and RCMP officers uh, co-located together is the alert has a certain number of funded positions which are allocated um, to offset uh, secondments from municipal police services. So in the example of Medicine Hat, uh, the Medicine Hat police officers that are assigned over to alert are actually funded by alert. Uh, and not the city itself. Now, Grand Prairie, um, Grand Prairie opted initially to fund five positions from our municipal contingent over to alert. A few years back, due to some budget considerations, we reduced that down to two. Now, that actually didn't result in a loss of positions to uh, alert because they essentially just used provincial funding to, to offset those. It's a discussion that will have to occur with the alert board as to uh, what role that the Grand Prairie Municipal Police would uh, would have there, but it's anticipated that we would continue to provide our municipal positions as we provide them today. And uh, I think there would be a further conversation as to 
how many of the provincially funded positions could be municipal secondments that alert his funding. Thanks for that. Councillor Berg. Thank you, Mayor Clayton. So my next question, again, is uh, around post-transition. So we've talked about transition, a lot of work, a lot of money. We're hopefully getting some money from the provincial government. Once it is fully operational under the city, from what I could read, we would be saving roughly $1 million per year. I'd seen that somewhere. I can't find it now, but um, if you could elaborate on that once the transition is fully complete. Mr. Manuel? Yeah, so under the initial modeling, and what the modeling really does is it, it projects out to 2028, actually 2029, I believe it is, um, and it shows inflationary increases related to things such as salaries and, and, and your operational expenses. Now, that was really done to represent what a transition would cost across those years. When you compare... It's all essentially based off 2022 current state, though. So if you were to apply the same forecasting that we're using for the Municipal Police Service and you applied those same assumptions against the same number of officers uh, to the RCMP and the what we receive today, there is a, um, there is a slight cost savings projected under that model. Obviously, there's a number of variables that could occur. But the projections um, do show it to be um, slightly more cost advantageous. Okay, so to clarify then, we're not comparing 2027 to 2023, but we're comparing both, uh, both machines in 2027. Essentially, the differential would be the same regardless of the year. So the total numbers would be higher on both sides, but the differential between the two is projected to... Um, to, to be different. Thanks. Thanks for that, Councillor Berg. Recognizing Councillor Bosch. Thank you, Mayor Clayton. Uh, my question is, if we decide on a municipal police force, and you talked about that being more nimble or um, flexible, programs such as let's say a stolen bike sting or the ride-alongs, thing, things like that, which you can't necessarily do with the RCMP at this point in time because it's not within their policies. Is there not like a reason why it's, why it's not in their policies? What legal risk do we uh, take into account on our side by doing something that the RCMP are saying, meh, we're not, we're not going to do that? So I think what, uh, Councillor Bosch, what you're getting at is, is really the local decision-making around operational tactics and procedures and those sorts of things. Uh, simply put, the opportunity that exists on the Municipal Police Service is the line of decision-makers is significantly lower than that of the RCMP. And when the RCMP are determining whether it uh, be policy, procedure, or operational tactics, they're looking at it from an organizational perspective and an organization that's nationally based and one that is looking to provide consistency where it can in its operational practices and administrative practices uh, across all of its jurisdictions. That's not the same consideration for the municipal service. So what might be a priority for the city of Grand Prairie in addressing something like bicycle theft? Well, is bicycle theft a a priority at a national level for the RCMP probably isn't, right? So um, it's not that they wouldn't have specific policy and procedure and stuff related to that, but it's, um, it's just more nimble in that the decision making on that is essentially an operational plan that's created at a, a local level that's reviewed by a chief of police that has the autonomy to essentially make the decision as to whether we do it or, or don't do it. Now, everybody is subject to the laws that are in place in Canada. So whether that's privacy laws, the criminal code or employment laws, all those different uh, statutes and legislation, we are bound by those as a municipality, just as the RCMP would be bound by them. And certainly when you're doing a risk assessment, depending on the nature of it, you're going to want to consult legal, which 
the service will have the ability to do. We'll consult legal advisors. And um, it just, uh, frankly, happens more nimbly. Okay, thank you. Thanks for that, Councillor Bosch. Councillor Bressy. Great, thank you. One area I'm paying attention to, because it could be a cost landmine, is the IT area. Really appreciated the attention paid in the report to IT. Um, two questions about IT is, I noticed a hybrid approach of systems where we use municipal services for business operations, police specific ones for police operations is the most likely course. Would that require separate devices to be in each ecosystem or would they still be able to operate with one phone, one computer per person? Yeah, no, that's what we're trying to move away from is supporting two separate systems. So when it's it's mentioned a hybrid approach, it's, uh, it's really through the use of things like firewalls that um, permit limited access or one-way communication from one system to, to another. And we're starting to get outside of my technical expertise, but the, guy, the folks that uh, work within this space tell us that that's a model and that, yes, no, the additional hardware requirements as far as like needing two computers and two phones and stuff, no, probably some additional software requirements and whatnot, but the, those are, we have built a fairly robust IT budget with the understanding that we'd be looking to replace the entire system. Great. And then speaking about IT or IT adjacent anyways, as I noticed, body cameras are in the capital budget, but operating wise, body cameras can be costly when it comes to data management and also FOIP considerations. What resources are built in operationally to support them? So we've actually followed the RCMP's approach on this. So the RCMP and their multi-year financial have allocated uh, $3,000 per member uh, as a result of body cams. Obviously, a camera doesn't cost $3,000 a year, but it incorporates things such as the, um, the back end, the evidence solution, the redaction, those components. So we've, well, you're right, we do have the one-time capital cost of that, but on the budget within um, the report, you'll see there's an ongoing capital cost operational equipment. It's built in there. Excellent. Thank you. Councillor O'Toole. Well, I was all in line. I had a lot of questions. And Dylan asked one, and Wendy asked the other one. But I do have <laughs> one question. That's the, that's the issue when you got a line. Uh, but federal public safety officer, or minister, uh, how do we, what is his role with our possible new commission if we decide to vote and make that happen? Mr. Manuel? Okay, so the federal public safety minister is, uh, that'd be a federal cabinet minister appointed by the prime minister. Uh, frankly, they would have no direct role on the, on the police commission. The Alberta's provincial minister of um, public safety and emergency services, they're the minister responsible for the administration of the Alberta Police Act. So that minister has various responsibilities under the Police Act as it pertains to oversight and, uh, and regulations of the, the uh, Police Commission. Okay. And I do go I'm going to slide one in, if that's okay. Um, sure, since you've been so patient. Well, I haven't said anything and I haven't got <laughs> grumpy, so... Um, <laughs> we've had a number of programs and technology asks uh, with our current uh, policing service. Uh, and sometimes it's been uh, a, sh a long time to get an answer, or sometimes we get denied. Uh, what's the process with the council is faced with a concern of crimes? How can we explore technology and programs uh, and make a reaction with this new police? So really similar to the... Um question that came from Councillor Bosch uh, earlier, which was, you know, w within the RCMP context, the reporting lines typically go, you got detachment commander locally in Grand Prairie, you got a district commander, and chief superintendent in our case, then you have a divisional commander, which is the provincial commander, and then there's obviously the commissioner of the, the RCMP. And then after that, you actually have Public Safety Canada in the, in the minister that you referred to. So... Under the municipal policing model, what you have is you have the police chief and you have the commission, both in Grand Prairie. That's, that's the line. Thank you very much for that. I knew the answer, but I wanted to hear it. Uh, 
Well, it's broadcast. Thank you. Thanks for that, Councillor O'Toole. Councillor Thiessen. Well, thank you very much, Mayor Clayton. Uh, thanks for answering all these questions, gentlemen. I know it must seem like your butts are a little warm right now, but uh, we'll do our best uh, to answer easy, ask easy questions. So I'm going to go back to, I have two questions here. I'm going to go back to jurisdiction a bit, just so I can understand it better myself. So if we were to transition over to Grand Prairie Police Service uh, and take away all those those partnerships that we might have with other forms of government, where do our borders lie for the service? Is it just within the city of Grand Prairie or do we go out regionally as well? So that's a, that's a fair question. So although they're municipal police officers, they're provincially um, sworn police officers. So they have the same authorities within Grand Prairie, or sorry, they have the same authorities within the County of Grand Prairie, the city of Edmonton, city of Calgary, so on, as they do within Grand Prairie. Now on a national level, uh, it gets a, a little different in that you're still a police officer uh, uh, in other provinces. And in particularly, there's times when an investigator has to travel to another province and uh, an interview with suspect or those sorts of things. Now that's done through collaboration with the, the other police services because uh, where it makes the big difference is on things like the provincial offenses. So a, a police officer from Grand Prairie isn't appointed to essentially do traffic tickets in um, out in British Columbia. But um, there certainly is a, a formal network to, you know, full policing powers within our immediate area, no concerns at all. When you get into BC, that's when you'd be wanting to uh, make connections with the local police of jurisdiction, whether that's the RCMP or the municipal police, and uh, you essentially work in collaboration. So um, what about Grovedale? Yeah, so Grovedale, it, we would have just as much authority in Grovedale as you would in the city of Grand Prairie. And Frankly, it's important to note that uh, if the county is being policed by the Provincial Police Service, so in this case the RCMP, um, and uh, those members need assistance, which will occasionally happen, there's, there's no question about it, right, we're, we're the hub, you know, we wouldn't leave our, our neighbors hanging. We'll, our, our goal is to protect life and, and property, and uh, just like we would in a, a fire situation where they need that emergency mutual aid, and certainly we'll, we'll be there to support them. Okay, that's, that's very reassuring. I do have then my second question here. So one of the, th one of the models I, don't, I didn't understand before, but I got to learn with the RCMP is when investigating serious crime units, or serious crimes, um, and one of my close friends is a detective with the RCMP, and he helped to shut down a really bad drug running and uh, abusive group, human trafficking group and stuff like that. Uh, in the mid to late 2010s, or 2000s, I guess, that would be around 2010. Uh, part of the RCMP's mandate is when, when they arrest an offender and they have to go to trial, they try to keep the officer protected, so they move them within the RCMP system. So in this, in this officer's case, he got moved completely out of jurisdiction, uh, out of province and everything to go serve as an RCMP member elsewhere. That was to ensure the safety of him and his family. Uh, so my question for you is, if we go to a municipal police service, what, what sort of steps are, would we undertake if we had a major crime uh, committed that was one of our detectives solved it? Uh, what are we doing to ensure their safety of their family members and the potential to influence them um, in regards to the law? So every department has protocols and, and processes to uh, uh, are pertaining to risk management of its personnel. And uh, where the particular area that um, triggers this more often than not would be actually like deep, serious undercover operations as opposed to, you know, most, most criminal element understand that the police are there to investigate crime and that, um, you know, that's, that's their role and it's, it's not a, a personal thing. Where the personal relationships influence things sometimes has historically been more in the undercover operations, which we as a municipal police service would not be looking to do those, those deep cover operations. That really is the wheelhouse of the RCMP, the provincial police, those larger organizations. Um, that being said, if there was a local need, we would certainly be reaching out to the director of law enforcement, seeking assistance from our, our provincial police service and, uh, and in further, um, uh, you know, federally perhaps. So 
that's a really granular detail of something that's as a transition team's not really one of our operational considerations it's it's certainly something that we're cognizant of but uh that will be for the chief of police to figure out with their team okay thank you councillor o'connor thank you mary clayton uh, <clears throat> uh, if we go to this transition and we are doing training will there be a focus on having new recruits get mental illness training and naloxone training to better deal with our homeless or our street engaged uh, uh, members in the, of our society mr manuel so certainly there's um a large part of the feedback we receive from the public consultations is a desire to see more robust um understanding training related to mental health and addictions and uh, certainly we would expect that to be incorporated into a curriculum one of the benefits that exist is the ability to develop training both recruit and ongoing into the um, curriculums of the the police training uh, protocols so uh, absolutely the place where that's held to account is really through the commission though if the commission says that we want to see this and we want to see that, the chief will make it happen. Okay, thank you. Thanks for that. Uh, Councillor Blackmore. Um, this is just a quick question around uh, online reporting of um, crime, I guess. Um, I, I look at that uh, 40 some, 40 some per percent of people who are interested in online reporting sort of as a lack of confidence in the service that we're currently providing. Um, I suspect from the people I've talked to that they look at online reporting as being a way to report a crime that they know no one's ever gonna show up for. Um, so if, if we get better at showing up for things, uh, I believe that number will change um, and online reporting may be less desirable by people in the community. I just, if you have a response to that, great. If you don't, we'll move on. The, the two are a little bit related as well. Um, one of the challenges with some of the property crimes is, is I think in the public, there has been a growing sense of perceived apathy about those things. You know, my garden shed got broken into, my lawnmower's gone. No one's likely coming anyway, so I don't bother reporting it. The challenge with that then, of course, is it doesn't get reported, so we don't know about it. Whereas if it's reported and we start to create, you know, um, a better sense of the volume of those things and the location of them, then we can better develop a plan to deal with those things. So they become a bit of a circular reference to some degree. Um, the lack of reporting leads to a lack of response, which leads to a lack of reporting. So. Um, you know, where we've seen people talk about the benefits of the online reporting is that element where we have much better data about what's actually going on um, and then can start doing things about it. Thank you, Mary Clayton. Um, to Councillor Blackmore's comments there, I do know already the RCMP are doing that. They're asking people to, you know, call in just so they can see trends and and what's uptick in, in the community. So it's not that they're not doing that already. Um, my question is in regards to safety, and this would be for our members if it, in a municipal force, I have the understanding that there is different qualities and costs that come with equipment. So for instance, vests, pistols, things like that, where you know a vest is $2,000 or $6,000. I don't want us saving us saving money uh, because you can get something cheaper. Mr. Manuel? That's a fair point. And frankly, the tools that we outfit our officers with are actually a, a big recruitment and retention factor. And uh, it's something that we're very cognizant of. And we've put together a, a very robust budget as it pertains to that sort of uh, um, equipment okay so good quality equipment is already in this budget that you've outlined i would say there'll be exceptional quality equipment excellent thank you thanks for that councillor bressy great thank you mayor clayton 
Something I'm curious about is in the transition report, there were some point in time counts we had about the um, seniority of members and supervisor positions and all of that that were very telling to me about why there might be benefit in municipal force. We did ask for updated point in time count numbers because there always is issues with just taking a one singular point in time look. That hasn't come back to council yet. I'm wondering if we've had any opportunity to dig into those numbers yet. So administration doesn't have a, a revised point in time at this point. Uh, however, based on on that request, certainly following today, I can reach out to the detachment to see if we can have something ahead for that the next meeting. Have we requested those numbers already? Yeah, I'm going to have to circle back uh, on that. There's certainly been discussion around it, but uh, the form, the initial questions were, um, or sorry, the initial point in time uh, was conducted locally through us. The request for a future point in time is uh, something that uh, we were looking to process through the, the RCMP directly and uh, through their human resources system. Yep. Um, however, I'll have to check the status of that. So thank you. Councillor Berg. Thank you, Mayor Clayton. Um, so my question is around uh, kind of a follow-up to Councillor Thiessen's good neighbours. And maybe you're not even this low down into the planning session, but when when I see the RCMP, they've got, you know, the jet boat, they've got the quads, they've got the equipment for uh, search and rescue. Being that we don't have a river or too much terrain like that in the city, are these things that we would drop and pass off to Claremont and their detachment, or, or, or have you gotten that low yet? Sir, it's been a while since we'll, com we'll combo so. this one. So search and rescue is a bit of a unique one in that it is often um, run out of uh, emergency measures, offices, and different things. The RCMP become involved in them as incident command typically, but um, they are coordinated a little bit differently than just a purely policing um, response. As far as equipment and other things, you know, it's very common for those things to get shared. Although, although there are hardline jurisdictions, and with the municipal service, your boundary is your boundary. Certainly, across the country, we see those boundaries blurred constantly. I mean, I, we we see it uh, in in the city I live in, in Winnipeg, with D Division and the RCMP. You know, D Division uses the the city's helicopter if it's in the air and they need it, and there's a vehicle as head out of the city and into their jurisdiction. There's no it, the, you know, the question isn't even uh, contemplated. What we've suggested in the plan is to um, maybe have not not rigid agreements, but have just a more formal understanding of what those things look like, particularly when you're surrounded by smaller communities that may be needing assistance from you in that regard. To Chris's point earlier, I don't think there's any way you would ever turn them down, but I think being proactive in some of that would be helpful for you and them to understand what those things look like. Yeah, so I guess my quick question then is, do we plan on owning a jet boat and quads and things like yeah, that? So, so further to that, so presently, you're right, there is, a, there is a jet boat that exists within the RCP. Now, that's a provincial policing asset. It's actually not even kept at the detachment here. It's kept out in the county. Um, so that asset will obviously remain with the provincial police service. We do have assets, though, such as quads, which would remain with the city. So it's just really a, di a division of uh, determining, you know, what is assigned to the municipal contract already and do we want to retain that or do we want to replace it or do we just not want to have it at all? Um, we do have the budget allocated for those particular items. Okay, thanks, gentlemen. Councillor Plot. Uh, thanks, Mayor Clayton. Um, recruitment's going to be one of the things, or is one of the things for me that is a, a major concern. So I'm, I'm looking at the report. It's saying that this, the salaries are being used using Edmonton's police force currently. Can you just tell me how Grand Prairie stacks up against Edmonton for what we're paying members? So we'll, we'll ham and egg this one. Uh, so it, we've actually used uh, Edmonton salaries plus plus a little bit. So Edmonton salaries 2020 plus two years of inflation. So the numbers in the report are actually higher than current Edmonton uh, police service uh, salaries because we've built in two years of inflation into them. Um, you know, again, we've done that understanding that you're going to have to be competitive in that market. 
we've also added in a budget uh, to assist with things like relocation and and different uh, you know starting elements that you might require along the way. At, at the root of your question, though, is the policing rates that we have identified for the municipal police service are higher than the existing RCMP rates. So higher, okay, so they're higher than the existing, but are we higher or comparable to what Edmonton's, what we're referring to this reporter? So they're technically higher than they are today only because they don't have a new agreement. Um, assuming they would get 2% and 2%, they would be exactly equal. If they get less than that, they're a little higher. Okay. And, and just on that, is Edmonton kind of a benchmark for all of Alberta, or is Edmonton on the lower or higher end of what municipal services are paying other for, for this? Edmonton's the leader in the province. Higher end, okay, perfect, thanks. Councillor Thiessen. There we go, sorry about that, buttons finicky. Uh, gentlemen, how much, how much does a brand new police cruiser cost? So, do you, do you have the number on you? The number. Yeah, because so there's because there's a fit up cost to it. Yeah, is it, so the total all in cost. Now, remember, not every car in the police service is a is a cruiser per se, right? Like a marked police vehicle, there's approximately twenty five of them in town. So of the forty five vehicles we need to replace, you know, twenty five of those are marked police cars. But a fully marked police car with all the equipment and stuff they require, and it's just short of seventy thousand dollars. 70,000, okay. Um, now my question to you is, uh, part of this is we're gonna have to procure 47 new new vehicles for for our municipal police service as indicated in the report. Um, and it said that uh, we could get up to 90% fair market value for selling the old cruisers or fleet uh, in the report here right beside that. Um, and typically the service lasts from 30 to 36 months for a police cruiser. So, um, what is what is the average fair market value of a 36 month old police cruiser so that i so that that i can't provide you so what what they mean by the 90 percent mr manuel i just need to interrupt you for a sec i do need to take a phone call i will be back briefly sure. uh deputy mayor uh Palat will step in thank you So what was meant by the fair market value is under the terms of the Municipal Police Service Agreement, any of the equipment that the RCMP are buying at 90% at city cost, 10% federal cost, if we choose not to take that equipment, which this report says we don't, it says we should just buy our own stuff and we can get a check from the feds for the fair market value of what those assets are worth. So we're actually not even gonna be selling them per se, because some of them might be brand new, some of them might be at the end of their life. Um, it's gonna be subject to the depreciation schedules of those, uh, those assets. Now, from a city perspective though, what we've done, and it's no different than any other fleet asset the city has right now, is we have an annual replacement. So, um, yeah, we have a budget to buy new police cars every year in perpetuity. It's, it's going to continue forever. But with that comes the retirement of vehicles. And with the retirement of the vehicles, kind of depending on the markets, there is a value assigned to them. I can't tell you actually exactly what it is because it actually just goes to fleet. The police service doesn't get the value of that vehicle back. It just goes to the fleet reserve. Okay, but we would get a check supposedly from the government of Canada based off of that? Because I'm just going to read the report here. This is where the question's coming from. Uh, it's saying that uh, it is assumed that the municipal police service will need to purchase all vehicles new and will receive 90% of the fair market value of RCMP vehicles when they are no longer needed. Right. So what we've said is we have two choices, right? We could either pay 10% to the federal government and keep all of their old used vehicles or during the transition, and now there's a caveat to that. Our understanding of it is we can't make that decision, or not, sorry, we can make the decision. We don't get those assets until the contract is concluded. In the meantime, though, we have people starting that need vehicles and those sorts of things. So what we're saying is instead of keeping that stuff, we're going to replace it, and at one time the RCMP are going to give us one check. But once we receive that check, it's done. We, it's not a continual thing. Right, so we're, we're 
we have a, a loose estimate as what we think that's worth. And we haven't even incorporated that revenue into this budget. That would be any of the funds received from the value of that are outside of this budget. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor O'Connor. Thank you, Acting Deputy Mayor. Um, my question, relate, and maybe it's, I'm being looking too far in the future, but I gotta ask it anyways. The relationship with the RCMP has been very, very good over the years. And I'm looking at post 26, 27, will the RCMP be allowed to work out of or have a member work out of our office? And that's just out of uh, recognition and respect for the service of the RCMP. So I think one of the things you see today, for instance, is although it's all RCMP, the RCMP operate in different business units. So we have municipal members, we have uh, rural members, and, and they're funded differently. One of the areas that we have cooperation, well, several areas we have cooperation, but the county, for instance, recognizes that drugs and drug investigations don't stop at the border, right? So although we have a city-funded drug unit, the county allocates an additional position into that unit, same with crime reduction and, and GS. Those opportunities still exist and are pretty prevalent in municipal police services, where, for instance, down in uh, Medicine Hat, they have a joint property crime unit that consists of both RCMP and, and city police. Uh, so in short answer, yes, we see opportunities to partner and, and have integrated units where it makes sense. Thank you very much for that. Okay, thanks, Councillor O'Connor. Uh, Councillor O'Toole. I looked beside my partners here, and there's got a long list of uh, questions still. I just wanted to, uh, when business comes to, uh, when we come to business, I'd like to make those motions. Okay, I'll come back to you on that, Councillor O'Toole, if we get that. Uh, Councillor Bressy. Great. I'm trying, I'm trying to understand a little bit better if we transition, what that transition looks like, and I appreciate that there's a dedicated team just for transition. What I can understand reading the report is there was mention that some of those team members might become the first civilian employees, but I can understand, is there a slow phase out of that team? Is there a time that team's just done? Yeah, no, that's a, a, a fair question. So the municipal police trend, because of the timelines associated with this change and the work that has to happen in the meantime, the... Municipal Police Transition Team allows for work of organizational nature, agreements, those sorts of things to commence or continue in this case, in some cases, while the recruitment of the commission and while the recruitment of the chief occurs. Once the police chief comes and they're reported to the commission, the police chief is the head of the transition. And our now, there's different ways to do this, but uh, the way we've designed it in the plan and what my recommendation would be is that the members of that transition team, then essentially just how we would treat the, the peace officers, the outreach workers, and the municipal employees supporting the RCMP, they would essentially roll under the operational and administrative responsibility of the chief of police. So they really would be the first employees of the department. Excellent. And so I'd assume that's what's built into the budget as well. That's correct. And then until that chief is hired, who does the executive director of the municipal police transition team report to? Are they responsible to the commission, to our city manager, to who are they responsible to? So the city manager. Okay. Excellent. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Councillor Bosch. Thank you, Councillor Plott. Um, what I was really surprised about was the fact that nationally RCMP really uh, cover about 20% of our municipalities, uh, that municipalities or population base? Population. Population. Uh, so that was shocking to me, but that leads into the attraction and recruiting piece for me. You have 80% of other municipalities or population also striving to get, you know, the best employees. In, in the labor market that we have right now, this climate is struggling to to gain employees. How do you plan to approach this? Um, and I mean this in a in a marketing sense. Like, is there a marketing campaign or plan? What's happening with that? So I would suggest that one of the top priorities for the transition team and uh, in and frankly the initial 
police staffing, because that's what's really directed to, is is recruitment. Um, I, I suspect that yes, you need a very robust outreach and recruitment. And simply, it's it's not going to be a matter of putting a job posting up on a website and expecting people to flock here. This is really very similar to what we would do in economic development. We will send out emissaries to. Um, you know, colleges and uh, universities and, and communities across the country with some focused attention. Is it going to make the sen most sense for us to send people to Toronto? Probably not. This is in Toronto. Does it make sense for us to send people to Thunder Bay? You know, perhaps it does, right? So what you're, what you're really looking at doing is, one, cultivating local candidates as, as best you can and additionally pursuing top candidates that are outside the community and selling the virtues of Grand Prairie. And one of the best things we have going for us is actually affordability. You know, police officers essentially make very similar wages across the entire country. Alberta actually has a very competitive pension plan, uh, very similar to the RCMP's plan. Um, but some other provinces don't have a plan that's as competitive as that. Um, there's a real opportunity here where frankly, a, a police officer's salary, and, and police officers are well paid. There's, um, I know in some communities, particularly south of the border, that may not be the case. So in Canada, they're well compensated. And um, that compensation in Grand Prairie's context allows you to have a very, uh, allows you to buy the single family home with the, the double or triple attached garage and, and have some of the recreational opportunities that frankly are a struggle for people in some of those larger communities, uh, such as Toronto and uh, in Vancouver. So just to touch on the marketing side of it, and maybe you haven't gotten into this at all, but would you align it with, you know, the new marketing that, for instance, the city uh, is planning already? Are you going to tag team? Absolutely. I think uh, there's no point in, in reinventing the world. And if anything, I think this is an opportunity for us to further enhance the work that's being done there because we're going to bring extra personnel and extra funding to those campaigns. So, you know, leveraging the provincial campaign, leveraging the local campaign, um, it, it's to all of our benefit. So, absolutely. Thank you. Okay. Thanks for that, Councillor Bosch. Uh, Councillor Thiessen. Thank you, Deputy Mayor Palat. Uh, and thank you again, gentlemen, for entertaining my questions. Um, <clears throat> so my question for you is in regards to, oh, sorry, um, just a general one, I guess for the people perhaps watching at home, um, there is a bit of a risk considering that the, the, depending on the election, the outcome of the provincial election, that we might not move forward with an Alberta provincial police force and we'll stick with the RCMP. Um, so I guess two questions in one here. What if the province doesn't proceed with the transition to Alberta provincial police force? And even if they do or don't, um, what would the roles of the APP or the RCMP be with the city of Grand Prairie if we went to a municipal police force? So in regard to the provincial police service, we mentioned early on that that was a consideration as to why we started looking at the service delivery model. But really what we've concluded is regardless of whether that happens or not, it makes sense in Grand Prairie's context for us to consider this alternative municipal approach. If the provider changes, you know, it's, uh, it's probably not going to have a, a significant impact on us. Where there might be opportunities is the province has signaled that uh, they're looking to decentralize a lot of their services from the Edmonton and Calgary hubs and uh, into place various specialties uh, around regional service centers. Uh, there may be opportunity that exists there to further explore what that could look like as as a service provider to the province or um, for certain services or to access certain services from them. So I, I think in, in that opportunity may actually exist with the RCMP as well. So I don't think it's going to a municipal police service in our context. Who provides the provincial policing service? I don't think is materially going to really affect that too much. Thanks, Councillor Thiessen. Uh, Councillor Bressy. Great, thank you. Something I'm curious about is just public interface interface with it. We've talked about online reporting and those policing things, but there is also the kind of less consequential but still important things to people like 
there needs to be a website, there needs to be branding, there needs to be a name for the department across all of that. I didn't see the costs, timelines, and who shares the responsibility for those types of things in the report. Um, so I guess first, who would own figuring out what the brand of this is? So ultimately, we see the preliminary work on that starting. Well, frankly, we've already started preliminary work on that. And uh, so the municipal police transition team, then really the commission and council uh, ultimately having, as far as logos and, uh, you know, the, the branding, you know, the car deco designs, those sorts of things. So uh, we have a, a plan to bring forward options and we see those bodies as being the decision makers on, on which path is best for us. Okay. And branding, app development, website development is cost that. Is that included in the transition capital costs? Yeah, we've accounted for funding. Uh, it, it may come across in various line items, but uh, yes, it's accounted for. Excellent. And then last question along these lines is there is the talk about having it residents intera interact. If they choose, they still have the ability to call in, but if they choose, it being able to interact with the service through a website, through an app. Um, my assumption is that kind of the turn on date with, for that would be when we be when this becomes the police of jurisdiction. Is that the correct assumption? Yeah, so that that is accurate, right? A lot of the conceptual design of the police service and in any variations from what the RCMP provide today um, would likely not occur until such time as, and, and that's why within the budget, you'll see the dispatch expenditures are delayed until we primarily year four on the operating side, because, you know, there's a recognition that we wouldn't be the police service of jurisdiction until those years. Great. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Bosch. Thank you. Okay, I'm pretty close to the end here. <laughs> so in regards to the shared services agreements, um, the cost for the special services, you had stated that you would hope you would have a relationship and you could build on on these services or cost sharing services. I'd, I don't think any of us want any surprises is what we're saying, like a chopper to cost us six times more um, and then us saying, oops, we didn't have a shared agreement. Um, will those be in place? So by default, there's the provincial police service agreement and, and ultimately it's the province that determines whether they want to do cost recovery or not. The best benchmark we have on this Councillor Bosch is what has been the cost recovery scenario for existing municipal police departments across this province over the last number of decades. And that scenario has been built into this model which is um, you know, what the expectations have been around that. And if there's any change towards that, I suspect it's gonna be a discussion point, not just with the city of Grand Prairie, but a discussion point with all the municipal police services. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor Berg. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. So I guess my question as we approach a wind up is in my mind, the concerns that I've, I've heard consistently. Number one is safety. Number two, who's paying for it. And number three is the romantic view of the RCMP. Um, what can you gentlemen share to reassure the public watching um, that this is a good and solid move should we transition? <laughs> well, so I'll give you, uh, I'll give you my perspective on it. So a move to a municipal police service is not a guarantee that you get a better, it's not an automatic, you get a better police service than the RCMP. What it's a guarantee of is that you have the ability to develop a better or a worse police service. And what I mean by that is the investment that the city makes in policing. And I'll tell you, your investment that you're making in policing on a per capita basis far exceeds that of many, many, many municipalities. So the money is frankly there. The financial investment the community making is making is there. The governance piece, right? This is, it's been said around the table here, governance is important. If the community wants to see a change in policing, if they want to see that the police are responding to local needs, whatever those needs may be, that ability is there. So, and it really is gonna come down to leadership at the end of the day. So it's leadership from your commission and it's leadership from who you select to be 
your chief of police. Now, if those people in that service are not meeting the expectations, you make the change. And what I mean by make the change is you replace the leader. And that's, it's the ability to respond to that in a, in a nimble manner. In an, uh, uh, you know, for instance, when you select a chief of police, it should be a national search. Using an executive firm that's done this work in the past, we've heard, this council's heard from other municipalities that have conducted such searches that the caliber of candidates out there is high and that uh, there is an interest in those opportunities. And uh, I can tell you, based off our cross-country tour that we've done and, and spoke with a number of chiefs and uh, senior police personnel, there is great interest in a community approaching policing in the manner that we are free of historical limitations that have prevented progress at some people's existing organizations. Um, so I think we'll be surprised at, at what we attract. And, um, you know. Yeah, and, and I think if I, if I could add something, I think, you know, certainly we don't approach any of these things as a, you know, a, a, a referendum, as it were, on, on whether the RCMP is a good police service or not. I think it's obvious that they are. Um, they come by that reputation pretty honestly, as you mentioned, the reputation that they have. I, I think, you know, they, they have a, a specific resource deployment model. They have policies and procedures that go with that. I think the question that you're asking as a city, is that the right tool for us at this, you know, juncture in our evolution as a community? Um, not is one good, bad, or the other. It's what's, what's the best fit for you going forward? Um, I think that's the important thing to remember. And, and just kind of further to that, I think, as was mentioned, I think we've been served well in the past, but there comes a point where the organization, the community's size, complexities, local needs, um, you know, may, does suggest a, an alternative approach. And if you allow that to go too long, you run the risk of running into a much more complex decision later on down the road, which involves many more personnel at a far greater cost. Yeah. And, and frankly, you know, from our, from MMP's perspective as well, we've done several reviews, not necessarily a transition plan like this, but reviews where, you know, the information we've provided to American Council has resulted in them, you know, maintaining their relationship with the RCMP because that was the right decision for them. Um, different communities have different needs at different times for different reasons. And I think that's kind of the, the crux of it. Yeah, thanks, gentlemen. And again, just to clarify that, you know, we feel the RCMP are doing well, but I liked how you, you worded it that, uh, you know, is this the right tool at the right time moving forward? So thank you. Councillor Bressy. Something I've been uh, wondering about is I noticed when I went to the open house in the trifolds, there was discussion about a real-time operation center, but I didn't notice that in the transition mm. report. Can you tell me, is that considered in this operational model presented? Yeah, it is considered in there. It's actually kind of built within there, and it's part of the investments we're making, particularly as it pay pertains to um, IT as well as our, our dispatch infrastructure. Now, there's going to be further discussions that need to occur around what the most appropriate staffing resource for that, whether that's analysts, whether it's police officers, so on. So we got some initial thoughts on that, but again, at the end of the day, the transition team is not the police chief, and uh, but there is sufficient capacity within the proposed budget and staffing models to accommodate it. Excellent, well, and still definitely an evolving com concept even in policing, so even just learning best practices. If I may have one more question, because I only have one more question. Yeah, which I'm surprised to be the first one tapping out. But, um, uh, well, but I, I'm the first one that said I tapped out, so I claim credit. I'm growing up. <laughs> um, I, I'm curious. I'm, I'm curious. Uh, we, there were lots of questions earlier about uh, training and cost of that. I'm just curious, when it comes to recruit class size, the report consider, talks about a 12 cadet class. What's kind of the minimum and maximum we need for class size to be somewhat efficient and to be um, doing a good job of delivering that training? So this provider's RAN classes as small as six. Um, and the upper limit, we're probably more comfortable up to 16. Okay. Um, but 
Now, the class does not have to comprise solely of our officers as well, right? So in future years, if, say, we were sitting at four, we may have partners that want to, you know, again, they're in the same sort of situation where they have one or two that they need to get into a class. Um, that's how you, how you make that happen. Great. No? <laughs> <laughs> Anybody surprised? Sorry. I'll move on to Councillor Bosch. Um, thank you, uh, Councillor uh, Pallott. You know, this, this isn't an easy decision for Councillor because we have such high respect for the RCMP and um, hence all these questions by all of us. It's, it's not something that we're taking lightly at all. Um, but what is a bit strange to me is if potentially the province is looking at a prov provincial police force why would they be potentially giving us $19 million to get a municipal force? <laughs> um, short answer, a bit speculative, is that then they don't have to do it. <laughs> you know, for the communities of your size that transition to municipal services, they can then focus more on designing a, a service that suits the needs of a provincial police service, i.e., you know, communities under 5,000 more rural areas. Um, that's my suspicion. I don't want to answer for them, but I, to me, that's the logic behind it is to remove some of those elements so that if they design a provincial police service, it can be more focused in that regard. Let, let me build upon that in the event that the provincial police service doesn't happen, right? What we've proposed here is it comes back to the modernization a, a different approach to traditional policing. And what we've designed is, frankly, it's gonna be the first new municipal police service since 1956 in Alberta. Meaning that it's been intentionally designed around that public safety model, as opposed to the historical policing interface with the justice system model. Now, lots of traditional services are, are, are trying to make um, progress towards that, but you know, you got to fight with things like historical collective agreements that limit certain people's involvement and those sorts of things. We're free of that uh, with our ability to start new. So I think there's a very, there's an interest amongst leaders around a case study. You know, frankly, one of the things you would have seen in the news over the last year, because, um, well, okay, I've seen it probably a lot more because I have the alert set up, but every time there's a news story talking about contract policing, we're talking about uh, an academic from the University of such and such has come out and said policing looks like this. We've assessed all of those reports and frankly much of it is incorporated into this design as to what the future of a, a police model would look like. Somebody just needs to do it and uh, this represents an opportunity for us to do it, for others to evaluate it, to see you know what a transition looks like. Because like you said, transition is a big decision and it is scary. It's less scary when somebody else has done it. Now, we've had the benefit to learn from some of the lessons from uh, other communities. That being said, some are going to le learn from us as well. With that comes, with that initial um, innovation, comes some financial support. And the province recognizes that they got to invest a little bit of money in order for somebody to prove a concept. Further to that, it's the additional investment in public safety infrastructure. If I'm the province, and regardless whether the provincial police service is going ahead or not, frankly, Grand Prix is a little underserved when it comes to public safety infrastructure. Because like I said, things like our emergency response team are based in Edmonton, meaning that people, not just in Grand Prairie, but Grand Prairie and the surrounding area, we don't have ready access to those services. This is an ability to close that gap. And again, regardless, because we're not gonna leave our neighbors hanging if those services were required, right? So. So for me, it's not scary, uh, but the ownership piece of it as a community, I think we, we have that accountability piece as a council and a community, um, you know, administration and leaders. So that's the piece that I wanna, for sure make make sure that we're doing the right thing, whether it's one way or the other. Um, and with saying that, I lost my question. Mm -hmm. oh my. Sorry, <laughs> don't come do back. 
back in. Okay, uh, Councillor Thiessen, please. Thank you, Deputy Mayor Platt. Uh, last question, guys, I promise, uh, unlike Councillor Bressy, who I'm sure has a couple more tucked away in his suit jacket. Um, so we've talked a lot about uh, the risks and the benefits of transitioning to municipal police service over the RCMP service. I guess uh, some of my, my question is, uh, what other limitations exist for municipal police service versus as compared to an RCMP service? It's a big question, I'm sorry, but there's, there's other. I got, I got some as limitations, uh, jurisdiction, Costs, technology, investment, recruitment, staffing, training, timing, and politics. Are there any other limitations that uh, municipal police service might face in comparison to the RCMP? They're, they're just so different, right? Like it's, um, you know, essentially the report does have that uh, that table that lists out you know, many of the things that you've identified kind of, you know, through the, the risks and uh, and what mitigations. Now, you know, with every risk, there's a mitigation, right? And uh, and you want to play that out. And, and it really goes both ways. So, you know, for instance, technology, we mentioned technology. Well, I would say technology potentially cost because of scale sometimes you can have cost benefit on technology, say on the RCMP side. However, from the Grand Prairie City perspective, you get what their technology solution is for that national or that divisional approach, right? Where on the municipal service, you might choose to do something without scale, so you might not be in, so you might not get the 21,000 members uh, price, you'll get a, a, a different price, but you have the ability to choose whether you do it or don't do it. Um, so it's just, it's just different. <laughs> it, it is, and I think, you know, there's a scale there where it starts to make sense. You know, Chris mentioned the number of municipalities in Canada that have their own police service, and they are of a certain size, and there's a reason for that because of the diminishing return of, you know, uh, being able to spread that cost across the RCMP start to disappear when you're Toronto and Vancouver and a whole bunch of other places. So. I think that's a bit of the puzzle too, is is the size and complexity of your community changes some of those factors. Um, and there's a reason why larger centers have the municipal police services because they have a lot of that infrastructure built in already. Um, so it's a, a much different conversation in the differences between them, you know, say between uh, Grand Prairie and say Vulcan as an example, where it would be a totally cost prohibitive for them to make that kind of technology investment. So I think it's a, Case by case scenario to some degree. Okay, no, I appreciate I pre appreciate that. There's a big question. Uh, so we talked about risks and benefits. <clears throat> some of the limitations I see, and please correct me if I'm wrong, is well, especially when we're talking about cross jurisdictional. Like normally we have K division meeting up with J division, and mm -hmm. they figure out where the pipeline of bad guys is coming from and the best place to stop them in the tracks. Whereas with the municipal police services. Correct me if I'm wrong, but we would have to reach out and make those connections between law enforcement a agencies in order to get the guy, so to speak. Whereas something, a bigger machine like the RCMP, they're, they're well connected with, through their technology and their means to uh, move criminal, I guess, uh, I guess move, move action a bit faster against criminal, criminal activity. And I, so some of that exists already, you know, some of the... Uh, tools that, that I mentioned as part of our presentation, things like by class and those kind of things, those exist for those very reasons so that even the municipal services can be sharing that information with each other. So I think a lot of that exists to some degree already, regardless of whether um, you're police of jurisdiction or the RCMP or a municipal service. Yeah, so to speak to that. So for instance, when something, when there's a, a file in Grand Prairie that originated in Grand Prairie and it has dealings in, in Nova Scotia, for instance, it actually typically does not run up through the bigger RCMP organization. It's it's literally the local, the local no, it's the local member here picks up the phone and calls out there. And it's really not different whether it's a municipal police service or whether it's a a rural one. And if anything, if anything, as was mentioned, eighty percent of Canadians are policed, primarily like they're they're um, police of jurisdiction. 
are a municipal, provincial, or regional police service other than the RCMP. That means that you're typically picking up the phone to call Edmonton and Calgary a heck of a lot more than you're picking up the phone to call um, Thompson, Manitoba, right? So in that case, you're talking Muni to Muni versus... So those, it, it doesn't really make a, a big difference. And at a provincial level, there is a there is a criminal intelligence service of Alberta. It consists of membership involving all the municipalities, um, all the municipal police services, plus the RCMP and, uh, and others. And, uh, you know, we would be partners with that as well as, you know, contributing to it and receiving from it. We'd be at the, we'd be part of the Alberta associations, the chiefs of police. We'd be part of the Canadian associations of chief of police. Yeah, I get your point, but I think, um, does not operate in the silos that um, it, it, it could if uh, you didn't know otherwise. Okay, so it's safe to say that uh, limitations are based off of perception and nothing else because we can speak between organizations, yes? The ability to do it exists. The processes to do it exist. A failure to do it is on individuals. Awesome, thank you. Uh, we're going to go to Council Bressy again. I know, I know. I'm turning over my paper, so I'm actually done. Um, <clears throat> question I've got is, I'm trying to figure out just uh, financial management of uh, police service with the, with the commission. Um, I wanted to be able to deal with unexpected costs or unexpected opportunities. I also don't want to just socket away money for the sake of socket away money. I'm wondering if a reserve strategy has been discussed at all for it or what reserves for uh, police service might look like. I'm going to pass that to our chief financial officer. Uh, thank you. So this will be treated like uh, any other uh, city department. So it'll be a service area within the city. Uh, so the discussions we've had are around, um, they've built in the appropriate amount for fleet. So we'll utilize the fleet reserve. Um, the current building is already um, considered in our facility renewal plans. Um, so that's covered. And, and then the, the city has the financial stabilization reserve, um, the ability to use that to treat any variances that may, that may come out in the future. Great. And then just really getting in the nuts and bolts then with the commission being responsible for the spending plan of this, not council, but with it being city reserve, city, um, the city CFO, all of that. How do you transfers to a commission work in terms of, is there an annual transfer, a monthly transfer, a quarterly transfer? How does that kind of segregation of finances work? So I'll tell you what, I'll, I'll speak to the authority piece. So essentially the commission still presents the budget to council and council will adopt or not adopt the budget. The commission essentially just provides the oversight to the police service on what they're asking. But the actual allocation, I'll pass that to Daniel. Yeah, and I actually think that right there answered what I needed to get. Okay. But I'm happy to get more information if the CFO wishes. But It's just an annual operating budget like any department would have. Great. Um, but if I'm understanding right, the commission sets the details of that. Council just gets to say the total amount. Correct. Okay. Excellent. Thank you. Okay. I'm just going to pull my own number here. Um, just... So if I'm understanding all the recruitment or all the training would be done locally if we if we move over to this model? So the basic recruit training, yes. We would still leverage like every police service does, including the RCMP locally here. There is a variety of, of provincial, national, and frankly, even international training opportunities that exist. We would continue to leverage those specialized, um, you know, we're not going to do canine training in Grand Prairie, for instance, would send people away for that. Okay, and I'm just wondering on the, the cost of it, if, you know, if we had three members that wanted to enroll, it, it doesn't sound like it'd be cost and conducive to do that. If it was looked at of just having this be done all by third party um, and why we chose to want to have it specifically in Grand Prairie. So we, so we have looked at doing it on a, you know, sending every recruit to a, another community. So for instance, such as Edmonton. Uh, two things there. I think we... Not to say that we would never do that, because if we were in a situation where we only needed to fill one vacancy and we just need somebody, well, that would be a, a path we'd look at. We wanted to open up this. We see local training as twofold. So one, with the numbers we're looking at right now, it does have a cost benefit. Additionally, it allows us to introduce those Grand Prairie specific uh, considerations 
uh, that were brought up, like mental health, addiction, um, diversity. But further, we really want to open it up to the number of candidates that can explore a career in policing that may not be able to spend six months in another community for their training. Um, so it's not to say that we would never do that, but uh, while we're doing this uh, multi-year hiring spree where we're, we're bringing in 12 people a year kind of thing, it makes sense for us. Okay, so there's some flexibility in how we train moving forward. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, Councillor Bosch. Thank you, Councillor Platt. Um, this is in regards to attraction and retention. What is the ability for an officer to move up in the ranks um, within this size of community? So that's actually one of the unique designs of our, our model. Um, we actually have a great number more senior positions than the current model does. So under the current model, you know, we presently, if you look at senior leadership at the RCMB detachment, we have a superintendent, we have one inspector, and we have three municipal staff sergeants. Under the proposed model here, we have a chief, two superintendents, two inspectors, and six staff sergeants, and then it kind of it cascades down there. What it ultimately, ultimately means is we have a, a more senior, it would likely attract a more senior um, police force than what we have in our, our current state right now. Uh, obviously, there's one of the abilities, and this is where size matters, uh, as Chad had indicated, was Grand Prairie is a sufficient size that we have sufficient diversity within the police service where if you want to be a canine officer, if you want to be a forensic identification officer, if you want to get into major crimes or drug investigations or... Um, we have a lot of those career opportunities that would exist in a larger service um, available locally. And uh, people, frankly, can cycle through those opportunities. They can go five years into the dog section and then come out and go into another section. So they have the opportunity to have diversity within their careers to promote within the organization without having to relocate from the community. Because current, currently right now, RCMP is at four years and then they're moved out of our community, correct? So that's accurate as it pertains to recruits, like the, the constables that, um, that came in here. Now, officers that are more senior in their tenure, like the, the sergeants, for instance, and staff sergeants, there's less, there's less emphasis on them having to, uh, to move out of the community. And, uh, you know, several of them have chosen to be in the community and... I don't think it comes as any surprise. I mean, our, our intent is uh, where possible to um, uh, develop ourselves as a desirable employee, employer for some of those members. Agreed. What is the ratio to that higher level versus the constables that are forced to move every four years? So if I'd be ballparking, I'd say 40%. Higher? Uh, so, for, so 40 to 6. So... Okay, so say there's 96 uh, RCMP positions here right now. I think there's approximately 40 constables on general duty. It would be the general duty constables, typically, that are the ones that would cycle every kind of four years. Now, what happens sometimes with, like, the corporals and whatnot is they seek national promotional opportunities. So, you know, they're a corporal in Grand Prairie right now, and a sergeant's job comes open in Red Deer. Well, they may they may apply on that and that can trigger them to go, you know, they could go in two years or they could go in six years. Like it just depends on their individual circumstances. Thank you. I think with that, we have an empty queue for the first time. So I'm just going to go to alleged services here, Ms. Hanson, just to update us on the uh, motion arising. Then I'll come to you, Councillor O'Toole. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, so if I could recommend uh, that Council refer this report and this matter to the March 6th, 2023 uh, regular council meeting. Uh, and that would be the suggestion, please. Okay. Thanks for that, Ms. Hansen. It is in our uh, eScribe packages. It's the third recommendation in there. Councillor O'Toole, if you wanted to go to business arising, please. If 
if you'd like to hit refresh, it um, we're just having a little trouble with the refresh. Uh, see if it comes up. Thank you. Did, uh, Councillor Bressy has it there. All right. Uh, <clears throat> I want to thank M and P, Chris and Lee, and all the staff that were involved in the the uh, reports. Uh, the reports have been received in the past were of no fluff, just the facts, and no opinions. So that is very much appreciated by this council. Uh, this council has had every opportunity over the last little while to ask any question we want and get the new information as it comes out. As today, this is a big decision for this council and uh, we still wanted to get make sure that the, everything was out there. And uh, just uh, I'll move on again. Uh, this decision is one of the most important decisions that this council will ever have to make, probably in the history of the city. And so with that, I will move it on to move I move the committee refer this report and this matter to the March 6, 2023 regular city council meeting. Okay, thanks for that. And that was number three in our package. Any discussion or debate on the motion? Councillor Bressy, is it to this or is it to something? Okay, go ahead, Councillor Bressy. No, I definitely, uh, I definitely appreciate this motion and appreciate the conversation today. I know that this was the biggest public engagement we've had in city history with hundreds upon hundreds upon hundreds of residents taking part in online engagements uh, with uh, dozen showing up at the open house with many doing the individual engagements. I don't know about the rest of the council, but I'm sure I'm not alone and also getting lots of emails and lots of questions in the community. Really appreciate the input that residents had to shaping what a municipal police service could look like. Definitely a very consequential decision for council to make. So I, I'm excited to be able to sit on this for the next couple of weeks so we can have a really good conversation in two weeks. So I think this is a good motion to let it sit for a, let it sit for a little bit. Really do want to thank uh, our staff, our, our consultant help, and everybody that put all the work into this, and especially thank those residents who did give their input. Because I think that regardless of if we move forward with municipal service or if we keep on with RCMP, there's always the ability to enhance the policing that we're delivering to our residents right now. And I think that that's, this will enable those conversations regardless of where we go in a couple weeks. Comments? Uh, Councillor Berg, please. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Yeah, for me, one of the big keys is finding out financing uh, and what type of help we may see from the provincial government. Um, I know initially it just said there was no number assigned to it. This will allow us and buy us the time to see what the province is willing to step up and help us with this transition. Uh, I know that there's a budget coming up at the end of the month, so uh, I'm assuming that we'll hear in short order uh, what uh, type of partnership we can work out with the province. So I appreciate that we've got a couple of weeks uh, to work this out. So thank you. Okay, thanks for that, Councillor Berg. I can just say for myself to kind of echo some of the things around here. Um, there's been lots of conversations uh, with our council and, and senior administration. Um, so we've had lots of opportunities. This report's another one. It's a live document, I believe, on our, our website now, so the community is going to be has the opportunity to read this as well. And on March 6th, they always have the opportunity to come forward if they had other comments on it. So um, with nobody else in the queue, I'll call that question to if everybody could please vote. Councillor O'Connor in favour. I lost internet connections. And with that, that carries unanimously. And with that, we will adjourn the meeting. Thanks for your time, guys. Appreciate all the uh, conversation today. You guys did good. You were within 10.